Speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science, nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau in Texas. We're recording this show in the middle of the day, uh, so it's still bright outside. It's kind of weird. Yeah. I'm used to podcasting at night. Which is the right time. Yeah, nighttime is the right time. But we're, we're switching things around. We got, we're juggling schedules. Kyle's doing school. Watcher's got people he has to save in space. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and bring him on. He is here with us, joining us while working. What's up, Watcher? How you doing, buddy? Fantastic, guys. A uh, whole lot of nothing to do at work, so podcasting makes the time go. Yeah, it's like saving people is, is it one of those things where you spend most of your time waiting and then like you have a few minutes of ter- terror and then you go back to waiting, right? Yeah, that, that's a perfect explanation. <laughs> you got a whole bunch of nothing and then you have something and it's happening all at once and it's super important and then you go back to nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, you never want to have anything to do. You want to, but then you're bored. Yeah. Yeah, that's and bad. I I totally a month get or that. Two ago, I was like, man, I wish I had something to do. And then I thought about it. and Was like, God, I'm a dick. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all we already knew that you were a dick watcher. So, Wait, but fair enough. Yeah, you're good at the you're good at what you do, both saving people in space and being the watcher for the show. So we appreciate appreciate you being here. And, you guys uh, said something nice to me. Don't start a precedent. Yeah, yeah. We'll go back <laughs> to give. We'll go back to giving you crap. No problem. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and do space weather news from spaceweather.com, where we get all our space weather news. Sunset Sky Show. When the sun goes down tonight, step outside and look west. The crescent moon is approaching Venus. For a side-by-side meeting on February 27th, be sure to look for a ghostly image of the full moon inside the arms of the crescent. That is called the Da Vinci Glow. Pictures are easy to take and may be submitted here, and they give a link. Also, a comet, a nebula, and a galaxy. Last night, deep inside the Big Dipper, a strange triangle appeared. It only lasted for a few hours, but Gerald Rimmon was ready, and he photographed it from his backyard in Eichgraben, Lower Austria. The vertices were a green comet, a blue nebula, and a silver galaxy. This triangle appeared oh so briefly when Comet Atlas C-2019 Y4 flew flew past the Owl Nebula and the Surfboard Galaxy. (laughs) Hey! (laughs) On February 25th, the threesome is breaking up now because Comet Atlas has to be somewhere else and it's about to visit our sun. On May 31st, 2020, Comet Atlas will dip inside the orbit of Mercury, only 0.25 astronomical units from the sun. Astronomers have seen a comet do this before. Comet Atlas's orbit is similar to that of the Great Comet of 1844, which was visible in broad daylight when it passed very close to the sun in the 19th century. Indeed, Comet Atlas might be a fragment of that same Great Comet. Will Comet Atlas become visible in broad daylight, or will it evaporate before it gets a chance to really shine? No one knows. Whatever happens, the heliospheric imager on board NASA's Stereo A spacecraft will be able to record the action, so stay tuned. Current conditions. Solar wind speed is 358 kilometers per second, and the density is 5.2 protons per cubic centimeter. And that is your Space Weather News update for this week. (laughs) Back also, you, uh, Earth has a new moon. <laughs> yeah, apparently, we've uh, captured a small object between 6 and 12 feet in diameter. What? Yeah. I think they, it's been captured for... Uh, let's see. This is from EarthSky.com. Uh, let's see. I wasn't going to read the whole story, but now you've put me on the spot. (laughs) All I said was, what? (laughs) (laughs) By the way, Watcher wants to know if the Atlas Comet hangs 10 off the surfboard galaxy. Probably did, bro. (laughs) (laughs) Let's see. uh, More than 30 observations were made of the object by February 17th. 
according to asteroid and comet hunter Kakper Weizarkos, one of the discoverers, along with astronomer Theodore Proin. So, Names. anyway, yeah, they they eventually confirmed it. So this, I think they were saying it's in like a stable orbit around Earth. Yeah. basically. huh? That's cool. Yeah. We got a new moon, folks. <laughs> it's another spaceship. A very small moon. Six feet. Yeah. Also, uh, Beetlejuice. Oh, yes. It is actually getting brighter now. So right on schedule. The brightness is increasing again. So it doesn't look like it's going supernova anytime soon. Well timed, sir. <laughs> Well timed, man! Yes. You hit the post on that. Perfect. I'm a broadcast specialist. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So it must have had a deep dive. You know, it obviously went down to 36 percent, and then there was an ejection of mass that appeared to change its shape. But it is growing in brightness again. So. Yeah. And that is normal timing. Just was a. Yeah, it has like a 420 day cycle. Okay. And. And that's why they were saying in later February it should be brightening up. And if it does, then it's that's you know evidence that it's still operating on its normal cy- uh, cyclical conditions. Right. So. And uh, yeah, the uh, the showdown between climate change and the mini ice age continues. <laughs> As uh, whatever effects caused by anthropogenic warming are negated by the mini ice age and solar minimum uh, continue, according to scientists. Mm. So looks yeah. like our climate will be stable for the next 30 years. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, what else do I got? I wasn't going to do a bunch of uh, a bunch of these stories. Mad Mike oh, yeah. has sadly passed away. The guy who built the... Um, steam, rocket steam rockets to check that he wanted to fly up and see if the earth was really flat or round. Yeah. yeah. Supposedly he claimed he was not trying to prove, prove flat earth. Like oh, that. I saw okay. that. Okay. All right. But so what was he doing? Just building rockets? Yeah. He's just, in, he's just building rockets. Oh, that's really just cool. Just going to check I it mean, out like for himself. That's, that's even cooler. <laughs> yeah. So apparently uh, his parachute didn't deploy Ugh. and uh, he, he was killed in a failed landing. Man. So, sorry to see that guy go. He yeah. was a, a pioneer of steam rocketry. Hey, man. Died for science. Yeah. Also, the Smithsonian has released 2.8 million images into the public domain. Ooh. And they're going to continue this process of uh, getting imagery from all of their collections and oh, putting them man. in a public searchable database free of charge. So, uh f- Ever since, I guess, the internet, and they've had stuff on the internet, but it's always been, you know, you had to... Limited it was like a paywall numbers, or whatever, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, so the public could not access most of this information, but now they are... Oh, man. They're going public, so... <sighs> sounds good. They're, they're actually... The, the people in charge of this are actually excited to see what, you know, people. all of the trolls are going to be doing with <laughs> people all People dig their, it up, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. Go check it out. Uh, yeah, Smithsonian man. Magazine... Uh, SmithsonianMag.com is where I got the story. Uh, yeah, so that's going to be All cool. All right. Well, I give I give a little bit a little bit of respect back to the Smithsonian. Yeah. Man. We'll see we'll see how this goes. Right, right. Uh, and then last thing from ancient origins ancient dash origins dot net. Uh, new evidence uh, evidence the lost queen of Nefertiti may be hidden in King King Tut's tomb. Yeah. The evidence is GPR data that there may be other hidden chambers within the King Tut's tomb. And we've talked about this before on the podcast when the news first came out. Yeah. Since then, uh, there have been multiple teams of scientists that have gone down into the tomb and done studies. Some of the first studies were uh, thermal That's studies right. where yeah. they were detecting different temperatures on the on the what was it? The northern and western wall, I think it is. Could be wrong about that, but um, anyway, they, well, the first thing is somebody noticed that it looked like there may be a door there, cracks They're, and fissures in the rock. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and then they did the thermal testing and saw that there was difference in temperatures right. around those cracks. Yeah, right. Sorry. So yes, you're you're absolutely right. So the next thing they did is they had some a couple of teams come in, 
Uh, one did GPR scans on the walls, and those scans seemed to show that there were uh, voids behind those walls that also had stuff in them. So they were thinking, these are chambers full of stuff. Yeah. Then they had another team come in, and this team claimed that there is zero evidence for that and there's nothing you know they did scans and they were like no there's no chambers and then they had another team come in that was like uh they repeated the test and they were like yeah there actually are chambers and they were cut off oh man so finally uh this new evidence is a is a team that decided they were going to do gpr studies on top of the ground yeah rather than inside king tut's tomb so yeah. they they went around and they found uh chambers underground that are uh, in line with the other chambers. In other words, their walls are parallel. Okay. Which, you know, that that is evidence that it is part, part of the of same, same tomb complex as yeah. opposed to a different one whose walls may be all oriented in different directions. Yeah, okay. Check it out. Ancient or Ancient-origins.net. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, so that's all I got for my, my news bits. <laughs> <laughs> Great news bits, as always. Yeah. I have this... This other thing that I wanted to talk about, and this is related to um, what we are doing with work, but it's it's ants. Yeah. So recently, we've been installing and planting a new orchard in a in a different area than we normally work. It's about two hours from our from the orchard that we work at normally which is in Kerr County, and this one's in Frio County. Yeah, so let's explain for new listeners. Basically, we our job, our day job, is we work at a vineyard slash olive orchard. And uh, and we've been doing that in this specific area for a couple of years now. And the olives, the, the vineyard... Four years. Yeah, the, vineyards, year. the vineyard is doing great for the most part, but the olive trees keep failing. Uh, That's right. The winter is too harsh, and it kills them, even though the area is very lush, and it's got, uh, you know, comparatively to the rest of the area, which is sort of scrubland desert, this area is in a is in a place where it has very, very deep, dark soil that's very rich. Um, but the olive trees do great during the summer, but then the winters come, and they're just a little too cold, and yeah. it kills them. A few days out of the winter destroys the trees. And right. It's like they can't handle the sustained temperatures, you know, in the low 20s. Right. Um so we've had, you know, they come back from the root, but then they won't grow enough to, it's just, we're just perpetual shrubs is basically yeah, what it turns exactly. them into. Yep. Um, so then we, you know, in the second and third years, we tried planting larger and larger trees to see maybe it was just when you get mature trees in there, people would say, well, they're more cold hardy. Right. So we planted six year old trees last, last year. They did okay over, over one winter. You know, there was some canopy loss, and then finally this past winter, they've, you they know, we're looking at them out. now. They 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 have almost complete and total canopy loss, which we're yeah. assuming is going to be doing the same thing where they're going to be coming back from the ground, which is useless to us. They won't produce crops. Right. So it's been really, uh, you know, difficult <laughs> because we're we're. <laughs> <laughs> we're in our fourth year here and we're like, God, these trees, you know, we're just losing them every year. And it's been, it's been, yeah. And it's upsetting. a lot of work, you know, you get hundreds of trees in and then we dig all these holes and we do, we have to do all this surveying because we're trying to put them in straight lines. And then we run all the irrigation, irrigation and we do all this work and we put them in and then they freaking die. Yeah, it's terrible. So we have another property and this property is, like I said, is about two hours south of the property that we have. It's off the Edwards Plateau. Right. Down in the flats. Um, it's about a thousand feet different in elevation, and it's in a completely different uh, climate zone. If you look at the 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 zones in terms of temperature, these maps that you can get on, you know the the um, USGS. from the extension agency in the USGS. Yeah, this is in a climate zone that seems to be optimal for the for the olive trees. So we've now planted five acres down there. And it's also sandy soil, which olive trees like. Yeah. They like soil that sandy loam. Sandy yeah. loam. They like soil that drains fast. They don't like to have wet feet. Yeah, as the farmers say. Yeah. So we we did all this work down there, and we were kind of you know uh, getting our hopes up, like, yeah, this is going to be great. But at the same time, we were joking because the bugs in this place are just crazy. You know, you yeah. find all these crazy bugs, and we're like, yeah, sure enough, there's going to be some bug that just wipes us out. Yeah. Right. Uh, but <laughs> we we planted the trees and they seem to be doing good and 
And uh, these are these are trees that we've kept alive for three years yeah. in a nursery in our original place. So we actually, Kyle, mostly just Kyle, built this nursery and we cover it with plastic during the winter and we keep grow lights or warm lights in there, heat lamps, so that during the winter they've survived. So we've actually managed to keep these trees alive for three years, unlike everything else we've planted out there. And we're like, all right, let's take a chance. These trees that have been growing and prospering for these past three years in this area that we built, this nursery we built, let's move them out here and put them out in the wild. <laughs> yeah. So it was taking a risk on a three-year investment. Yeah. So for those of you in the Discord that saw the picture of that dozer with those teeth and this huge plow, that's we cleared the five acres of mesquite. Yeah. And then we used this massive plow called a Rome plow and plowed up the ground. It plows it up like, you know, over a foot deep and turns the soil over. And, uh, and then we, we installed the irrigation system. We have it on a automatic valve that comes on. It's, it's on a timer. We're going to be installing a weather station. We got internet installed down there. It's way out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So we're going to be able to start uploading data Monitor, about the place. Monitoring it, yeah. To apps on our phones where we can see, you know, we'll put a flow meter in there so we can see if the water's turning on and if it's actually got flow or if there's any leaks and all this stuff remotely. Yeah. Since most of our time is going to be at the other orchard. So it's been a it's been an interesting project. Well, about three days after we had begun the planting <laughs> process, <laughs> we're at the end of the day planting and I, I go to walk back to the beginning to, to the area where we had started planting to do some pruning and <laughs> notice that there were long stretches of rows with trees with no leaves on them. Yeah. And it turns out we have leaf cutter ants <laughs> down there and they're climbing up these trees and just completely defoliating the trees. So that obviously led a, a panicked research project on the part of everyone on the team to figure out how to deal with these ants. Starting because with, they work fast. Yeah. So starting with the farmers down there, when I started talking to them on the phone and you know, calling people to see what they do. They're just like, oh, God, oh, uh, no. <laughs> you better. I, I don't know. You call this other guy, you know, and I call <laughs> that person. They're like, oh, geez, I, I don't know. <laughs> so basically what I got from the people that have farmed down there for years with experience and even people from the chemical plants that deal with pests in the area, they're just like, there's not really a way to control them. You, they're very difficult to control. You can try to kill the nests. So. And the, and the reason for that is because of the way they make their food. Yeah, right? this is what I'm getting into. Yeah, okay. So so starting to research these ants has just been blowing my mind. And like Archer <laughs> was here a couple of weeks ago and we I was we were going through all these videos online about these leafcutter ants and Yeah, GMA. Yeah. So they don't eat anything except what they farm. So they climb up the tree, they cut these leaves down, they take them back to their nests and they chop them up and they they make a bed and that this bed is actually it's a it's a series of tunnels. They're they're actually building a like a structure out of the leaves. They stick them together and they have tunnels all inside and everything. Mm. And so each piece of the leaf is actually there's a spot found and it's fitted into place and stuck in place. Glued together. Yeah. And then these leaves grow this fungus and the ants then are climbing through this this network of tunnels built out of leaf particles that are growing a fungus and they harvest the fungus and that's what they feed themselves, their, their, their babies and, and the queen. queen with. So, so you, you can't kill them with poison. Right. You can't put a, a poisonous food out there for the ants because they're, they're not interested. They don't eat anything that they don't grow. Yeah. So they actually are farmers. Right. And fungus farmers. Yeah. And they've been doing this for apparently 50 million years. <laughs> Holy crap. So it's really crazy because the way they reproduce in terms of hives, the queen eventually makes a, a like lays a queen egg. And then that grows into the large queen ant. And then she leaves the hive and takes, you know, a number of, of drones or whatever with her. Yeah, the flying kind. Yeah. yeah, they grow wings and then they leave and they fly off and she finds some drone from another hive that's flying around and they mate. And then 
she goes and with her little group of of workers, they find a little place and they go down in there and she's carrying with her spores of this fungus that they grow. And from the original nest, from the original nest. Yeah. You know, she takes some of the fungus and shoves it in her, her mouth and stores it in there without eating it. And then once they go get some leaves and bring them down in there, she then puts those spores, plants those spores into the, their new leaf bed and then grows that fungus again. This fungus exists nowhere else on the planet except <laughs> in these ant beds. So it is completely unique to these ants. Like they've been, and, and apparently, I mean, it's it's like GMO, right? It's been genetically modified by these ants yeah. over the 50 million years that they've been growing it. Right. And if, and the ants themselves have also sort of symbiotically developed in a way that supports the fungus. Uh, the, there's worker ants down in there working on the fungus and they, on certain portions of the underside of their body, they grow a bacteria and it's also white. The fungus is white. It's, it's, you know, it's a mycelium. Yeah. It's beautiful. Like a mycelium fibrous. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, uh, if anybody's tried to grow mycelium out there, uh, it is highly susceptible to microbial spoilage. So the ants grow this bacteria on their chests that they can take off of their chests and like put on to the leaf beds and it actually uh, promotes the growth, growth of the fungus and also fights off other <laughs> bacteria that would take over the fungus garden. Oh my God. <laughs> and because they're all meticulous workers, they, they're always going through their cleaning stuff. So they, they find little areas that might be infected by something and they cut it out and they take it and they have, a, they, they have these midden piles. These yeah, midden refuse. disposals piles that are always downstream of their nests and they pile this stuff up and that way whenever rain comes it washes it downstream and it never goes back into their nests. Wow. So <laughs> it's just I don't know. It that idea just blew my mind that like what these what these things do and and the question is how how do they know what to do, what they're doing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Like when the new queen is born, she's never been outside of a hive. She's never grown a fungus. She's, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so she leaves with this fungus in her mouth and then goes and plants the spores on the new leaves. And yeah. it, it's just crazy. It's just mind blowing. And the idea me. that they have carried this fungus through multiple extinction events yeah. <laughs> to the present age. And so it, this fungus is pro possibly something that existed in the, you know, it, uh, in the Triassic period. Right. Uh, 50 million years ago is like post, uh, well, let's see, it would be, it would be Cretaceous tertiary. So it'd be tertiary period, like the early tertiary. Yeah. Right. So they, <laughs> so they've been carrying this fungus forward. For 50 million years, and that's why it only exists here, because it's obviously, if it, if it was native somewhere else and they've started using it, right. I don't know. But I'm, obviously, it's probably unique now because of how they it's changed to match them. Yeah. But still, the idea that they've been carrying, they've been carrying this fungus, and tr it's sort of like with, with human crops. You know, a lot of these crops, we don't know what their origins were because the I'm plants saying. don't exist anymore. That's what I'm saying. It's the <laughs> same thing. Like, they have this crop that exists, and it's very... And if they stopped... If they stopped cultivating the crop, the crop would go extinct. Right. It can't survive yeah. in without the ants taking care of it. Yeah. So just like corn or whatever, you know. Yeah. Without us taking care of it, it would it would not survive on its own. Yeah. All right. So go back to So the, wait, wait, I'm not the, the watcher is is asking about spraying the trees and anti fungal yeah, yeah, dilute to a solvent. So to control fungus, first of all, is is very difficult. And it is more of a preventive measure than actually attacking a growing and existing fungus. I mean, right. there, there is a little if bit of that. You have a fungus, it's too late. It's, yeah, it's very hard. So the sprayers that are required to spray any type of antifungal have to be, have to have high powered fans that are, where the, the um, output of air from the fan is in line with the spray head. The spray head has to create extremely minute droplets and they're then blown out by the by the air 
and the air is also agitating whatever plant you're you're spraying. So it's it's making the leaves turn and twist and flap and everything. And so that every single square centimeter of surface area on the plant gets coated with these minute droplets of water that contain your antifungal, you know, your your um, yeah. fungicide, as it's called. So you got to have a special sprayer to do this and still that is a preventive measure so you can have you know like for the grapes we have these we have basically a a regimen because you know farmers for the past 30 40 years have dealt with certain types of fungus that that exist in your in your vineyard and so we're spraying these fungicides that have been developed to mitigate that that fungus keep it from, from growing yeah, keep it from growing yeah once you're overcome with a certain fungus, it's almost impossible to stop it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, that's that's an interesting. So we're looking at how do we deal with these ants because you can't just poison them. You could put a poison out that when they touch it, it kills the ants. But the ants, the ant bed, the hive has like upwards of 10 million ants in it. Right. And, they're and she's laying 30,000 eggs a day. <laughs> and they're deep. Yeah, their their nests go up to twelve feet deep. They cover hundreds of square feet. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 crazy. So we're you know, without using some type of chemical pesticide, we would otherwise be organic in terms of our olive orchard. We can't be organic in in, in our vineyards. Um, they, they wouldn't survive on the scale that we're doing it. We we wouldn't be able to be organic. But with the olive trees, we can be. Yeah. So it's it is part of the consideration, like how, you know, if we are we're almost organic, yet we're throwing out some chemical to kill ants right on the surface of that. Now we lose the ability to be organic. So we thought of diatomaceous earth, um, which is a natural way to to kill insects. Yeah, an organic way. But <laughs> but my dad has this method that he's used for his hummingbird feeders where he just smears some grease on the wire that the hummingbird feeder is hanging on, or he puts grease on the tree branch before the hummingbird feeder. And the ants don't want to step in that grease. They'll come up to it. They'll stick a foot in there. And then they're like, ah, and they're trying to <laughs> clean it off. And they, they yeah. don't, they don't cross the grease. So they don't get to the hummingbird feeder. So we were like, all right, went to the shop, grabbed a tube of grease <laughs> and a paintbrush, and we just started painting a little four-inch section around these trees and the stakes that are holding the trees to create this grease barrier. And it completely stopped. But that not a single ant has climbed a single tree and cut a single leaf since we did that. Right, and we didn't have to kill them. We didn't have to kill and them. We didn't have to put out any poisons or anything like that. So, so that was really cool. So grease is not <laughs> technically organic, <Yeah>. but... <laughs> It is an organic <laughs> method because we're not actually. <laughs> yeah. I also learned that that uh, some of these uh, places that are cultivating the ants for study have built these massive viewing areas like in a museum or something for people yeah. to come in and, and watch the ants at work. Yeah. And they're completely open. Yeah. They've painted some type of uh, very slippery stuff ah. on the inside walls of the chamber that have the ants. So the ants won't ever, so they're open chambers. You can look down in and watch it, but the ants won't climb up the walls because there's a uh, slippery okay. part. Yeah. So that was interesting too. But yeah, right now we're using tractor grease. Yeah. <laughs> so technically uh, not organic, but, um, but still it was, uh, we had to do it quickly because they were stripping these leaves off the trees and it, anyway, yeah. after, after looking into what, what these ants are all about and how they function, I'm just like. I don't want to kill these ants. Right. They're too awesome. It's They're really awesome. But even if we did kill the ants, the ant bed, which we actually found where their bed is. And then I ended up driving all around the property outside of this little five acre, five acre lot we made. It's like 400 acres and found multiple other ant beds. And they just look like it's like you've got all this foliage and all this woods and everything. And then suddenly there's this sandy patch with all these little volcanoes. Yeah. And some of them are, you know, up to a foot and a half in height, but they're just a, it's just a sandy volcano looking thing a with a hole in with it. With a funnel and a hole. Yeah. <laughs> and they, I mean, they're huge. Some of these areas are just massive with the, the right. ants have built. So even if we killed the beds that are on the property, 
they still fly. And I've been down there uh, before I ever knew what they were when the ants were flying. And it was just like, whoa, this is crazy. Millions of huge ants (laughs) flying all over the place, (laughs) landing all around the barn and stuff. We're just like, what is going on? Yeah. Yep. But uh, yeah. Crazy stuff. Yeah. Cool science on the ants, like stuff going on beneath your feet that you don't even know about. So, yeah. They've and been, they're big. They're they're large ants. Yeah. Half an inch or like the bigger size workers are about a half inch long. Yeah. Yeah. And pretty impressive. And they're not they're not, you know, they're not aggressive. They don't Right. They're not They're not stingers either. They don't sting. They might pinch you or whatever if you piss them off, but Yeah. So, it was good to be able to prevent, prevent them from destroying our crop, but without murdering uh, millions and millions of ants <laughs> <laughs> that turn out to be really awesome and they're farmers like us so we we're like hey yeah. okay you know we can work with you guys just don't climb our trees okay <laughs> <laughs> there's plenty of other green stuff out there for them to eat yeah there's just tons of it but see there was an ant bed right there where we cleared that five acres yeah so on one side of their ant bed we made the land completely and totally barren until right. we started planting these these trees with these nice lush little green leaves yeah. that have been cultivated in a in a greenhouse for three years and they were just like oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yep. yeah so there you go yep ant report <laughs> farm <laughs> update that's what we've been doing yeah okay so, so they've been farming for fifty million years folks yeah nothing yeah. new they, under the sun they know what they're doing. So we're going to go a little long here. Okay. Uh, let's just go ahead and and, and do this. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the coronavirus stuff because I've been following this, right? I'm just interested in what's happening here. And uh, I have a summary here that was posted today. So I'm just going to read this real quick. CDC reports six new cases among repatriated Americans. 83 are being monitored in Nassau County. Norway has confirmed its first case. Eight are quarantined in Westchester. Uh, Health and Human Services confirms 15th case. Uh, Iran deaths hit 19. Brazil confirms first case in South America. France confirms second death. Tokyo pushes back Tokyo Games cancellation talk. Greece confirms its first case. Germany unleashes fiscal stimulus after confirming new cases. Uh, Kuwait, Iraq, Lebanon, and Bahrain confirm cases. Finland confirms second case. First two cases reported in Pakistan. Uh, Congress begins talk on coronavirus spending bill. Germany health minister warns we're at the beginning of epidemic in, epidemic in Germany. They have five new cases. Italy confirms 12th death. Cases soar above 400 in Italy. North Macedonia confirms its first case. South Korea cases soar above 1,200 as government begins testing of 200,000 people. Brazil confirms infected patient came on plane from Paris. So I just saw a story today also that a, a flight attendant uh, that, between Korea and LAX has now been diagnosed with it. Yeah. So, uh, the numbers are hard to work with for so many of them, like the bulk, the vast bulk of the cases come from China and a lot of people are suspect of the China numbers, the numbers they've been publishing, they've changed their counting procedures. Okay. I should say it like this. They have informed the rest of the world that their counting procedures have changed three times now. Um, so, and it seems like when you look at the graphs, <clears throat> it seems like what happened in China is as the case, as the new cases rose to a certain, they peaked at a certain point to where they were like, no, they weren't putting out more than 3000 new cases a day. And people were saying, well, that's just the limit of their medical ability to test. Okay. Okay. So it doesn't mean that that's how many cases they had that day. They were just confirming three around between, between 2,000 and 3,000 new cases a day for a while there. Because that's how many people that they was, could process. Right. That's the, yeah. limit of their, that's the limit of their ability to process in those provinces, provinces that had the problem. Uh, they did put about, uh, uh, at the peak, they put about 700 million people and, and basically house arrest. Uh, they're trying to stop that now. They're sending some people back to work, or they're trying to. They've, they're, they're saying they've opened factories, but very few people are actually going. Um so the, what what it, to me what it's looked like is the number of cases that are being reported versus what's actually happening. Are, there's a big disparity there, and then there's this there are these claims in the news and other people are saying like, look, it's just like the flu. It's not that big of a deal. But no one, you know, no one dresses up in hazmat suits or wraps themselves in saran wrap because of the flu. Uh, yeah. 
it is a coronavirus and there have been other corona type viruses that's a that's a, a family of virus the corona but this is it's called novel because it's brand new uh there is some people think that it may have actually escaped from a, a lab there is a level four bio lab in wuhan in the city where this all started at first they seemed to blame it on uh, a food market like a it was basically a black market for food where they were selling bats and snakes and stuff and they were thinking yeah. that this is how it got out but there's also there was also an article that uh, the cosmic tusk published um that it may yes yeah. or linked to on his blog that was the 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 idea that it might have come from space right right so i've been following this with interest i can't tell what's happening i can't it's hard to tell uh, it goes back and forth but from people seem like people in power seeming to say that that this is really serious to back to saying well this is not really that big of a deal it's a, and there's politics wrapped up in it people are saying you know don't panic and other people are saying maybe we should panic or it, it's going to be a big deal and then it's they're saying it's not going to be a big deal i can't tell but it seems like it's spreading and there's no control uh they're trying there are people are putting in measures but the the ink the prob one of the problems with this one is that the incubation period is so long and it's an asymptomatic incubation so people can be carrying it for up to two weeks maybe even three or four now they're saying they're saying that they may need a 28 day uh quarantine to really hmm. effectively shut it down previous to that they i mean up till now they've been doing a 14 day quarantine so two weeks right right and before that it was four days so once they started to figure out oh this thing can incubate for a long time and you're asymptomatic which means you're walking around as a quote unquote super spreader somebody who has the virus is completely doesn't show any symptoms but the virus is going crazy in their system and therefore every every breath they take every any cough or sneezing or anything like that gets out into the out into the open and it's it the virus can travel by aerosol which isn't the same as um uh, it's not the same as droplets, right? So when you sneeze, you make little droplets, but there's also like an aerosolized, mm -hmm. like tiny, tiny, tiny particles. And so it, there's a difference there. Like if, if I had to sneeze and I like make little spit droplets that land on something, if that's the only way it could be transmitted, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But if it aerosolizes and it can work that and it can transmit that way, it gets in your eyes or up in your nose or something and you're just breathing in little tiny particles of a sneeze or a cough. Right. So they're saying it's transmitted by aerosol, which is worse than droplets. And, uh, and the incubation period is so long. And so they're trying to catch up. It seems like people have been trying to catch up. The, the authorities have been trying to catch up with what they're finding out about the virus. And uh, so one of the numbers I've been like, the, 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 the mortality rate is hard to, um, to calculate. And Watcher may help me on this, but they calculate past epidemics mortality rates because all the numbers are in and the epidemic is over so you can look back in the past and say okay for SARS or MERS or you know Ebola or whatever any of these other viruses you can see how many people caught it and how many people survived it and how many people died and then you use those three numbers to calculate a mortality rate all right the mortality rates they're calculating right now for coronavirus are low and they're given you know numbers anywhere from one to two to maybe three or four or five percent but they're calculate but the problem with that calculation is we're in the middle of this epidemic so a lot of the people who have caught the virus still have it and have yet to either survive or die right so that so the numbers are off you can't look at it and say well seventy thousand people have caught the thing and only this number have died therefore the mortality rate is x right that that's not a proper calculation because uh, of those 70,000 people, 40,000 are still sick with the virus and have yet to either survive or die. So we don't really know the mortality rate numbers yet, and they're always changing and fluctuating because people are trying to calculate them in the midst of the epidemic. Right. One of the things that I see is what's what looks like an overwhelming of whatever local medical uh, facilities they have. Because the problem seems to be that aside from the mortality rate and how many people die is that up to 20 to maybe 30% of the people who do catch the virus require ICU support to survive it. And if that number is right, and a lot of people catch it in any given country, that's when the mortality rate will go up. Because once the all the ICU units are full, then anybody who then then up to 20 to 30 percent of the people who catch it who require ICU to survive it, but don't get ICU because all those units are being used, they die. So that's what I see right now. And I, I don't know, you know, people who are listening to this in the future, if there's a future, 
We may be all, you know, <laughs> like I'm just saying, like hopefully you guys in the future listening to this are like, yeah, the coronavirus is not a big deal. You're listening to this a year from now, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're in your bunker because the coronavirus killed everybody. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. The difficulty, we like we've stayed away from this topic because this is a podcast and every show is just... You know, yeah, it's people, there for whenever people decide to download it years from now or right now. So, um, but this is our current events segment, right? So just yeah, so watcher, it. come on and give us some input on the nature of coronaviruses. Let's hear what you got to say, buddy. Yeah, so, um, coronaviruses, first off, they're an RNA replicant virus. Um, so what that means, uh, Ebola. And filoviruses, those are the ones with the hooks on the end. Ebola is part of that family, are RNA replicating viruses. And part of the thing that's really problematic about them is they can replicate very quickly because instead of having to replace your cell's DNA with like its nuclear DNA, they can all they use do the is RNA. Send in their RNA and your transcriptase, the little, um, they're sort of, the way they're represented in textbooks is like these floating orbs come along and they go, ooh, RNA, and then they latch onto it, and then it becomes a string of DNA. It skips a step, because otherwise you'd have to separate the DNA out into two strands of RNA, and you'd have the messenger RNA come down and print it, so it's faster. Okay. And also, because they don't have a complete strand of DNA, it's easier to bypass the cell membrane. Uh -huh. And the proteins around the outside of it. So think of like a shoelace uh, encased in like an epoxy resin, right? It's got this weird, thick sort of shiny coat around this like strand of information, the RNA. The outside of that coat will have these like proteins that have spiked looking like claws on. This virus happens to have a type of claw that is has a high affinity for molecular bonding to the stuff that's in your cell membrane. So it latches on really easily and it holds tight. Yeah. Um, so like little spaceships docking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This has a really good docking hatch. Yeah. That's a good way to think of it. <laughs> um, and then lastly, the thing that's problematic coronavirus, um, where it latches on to the cells to infect all coronaviruses that we know so far are respiratory. Yeah, but like SARS, for example, latched onto the upper lobes of your lungs. It's bypassing all the stuff that you normally have to clear your congestion. Right, you've got the openings that come down into the lungs, the bronchioles, and then you've got all through your throat and esophagus these little hairs that push stuff upward, so you can cough it out. They bypass that if they get low enough. If they latch <laughs> low enough, you don't have a way to protect yourself from the congestion. Right. Which becomes a problem. So what is the um, overall sort of uh, feeling or, or what? I don't know what the word is amongst you, you people in the medical field. I know that towards they, this virus, he was showing us that they were getting notifications about it. So, but yeah, watch yeah let's... And I mean, it's anytime there's any sort of pathogen that you know, could be, um, you know, endemic or dangerous, there's always notifications sent out, especially to EMS saying, hey, just so you guys know, you're all uh, officially on standby in case some shit goes down. Yeah. And if it does, um, you're all going to die. Yeah, basically like FEMA and the government <laughs> take over and the trucks are ours and you guys are ours. And yeah, <laughs> it's not really that bad. But um, yeah, they do send out notification emails, especially since, you know, first responders tend to be exposed to lots of stuff. Right. So they already and they sent you guys stuff about this, what, two weeks ago? Probably about three. Yeah. So um, first responders have been notified of this three weeks ago. So, so what FEMA region are we in? <laughs> I don't know. I should know that. I'm I've just... taken like the national forces for. I mean, how big, how big, how big are FEMA regions? Are they really big or are they small, like county sized? Um, so typically they will be like large regional. Texas is kind of a rough place to define them by because Texas is, is usually like this. It's like what five average states. Yeah. Equal one Texas or something. Austin's in FEMA region 33. I know this because of no agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole way that um, it's called incident crisis or crisis management or something. No, it names national incident management 
system. So you, it's basically a scaling upward. So you have like size one is the city, then the county, then the six counties, then like the 18 counties, then the yeah. corner of the state. And it keeps going outward to the top where at, at the end of the day, you basically got this game of telephone going on from your command table yeah. at the outside of the incident and it goes down to each region within it. Okay. So the number of regions would depend upon the scale of the problem. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. I have another. Well, let's let's go back to the uh, just what's the overall feeling from you and your colleagues on this thing? Are you guys uh, on high alert or are you guys like, well, it's probably not that big of a deal? Like, what's the what's the deal? Um, I would I can't speak for everyone. I would say that my general feeling though is that, like all things that are ominous and potentially just really really bad and could do a lot of damage, uh, we ignore it. <laughs> Because we have to. Yeah. Like you, if you take the time to think about it, you're going to potentially screw up. So you just don't. Right. Okay. Uh, so I read somewhere, tell me if you think this is right. I'm sure you don't know the actual number, but that there is like about not an estimated number of like 900,000 ICU units in the United States. Does that sound right to you or do you think it's a lot more or something? Um, I mean, so is that like ICU beds or just ICU units? Yeah, like beds, like places where you could put a patient and have them under ICU. Okay, so like in San Antonio, we'll use it as a metropolitan like model. You've got one, two, three, seven, eight hospitals, I believe, that have an ICU. Yeah. Um, crap, Samsi, nine. Um, and let's say average, you've got 30 beds in each of those ICs. That, that's actually really high. Yeah. So 20. So that's 180. And then, so may, so 900,000 is probably right-ish? Yeah, I would think so because San Antonio is roughly like a fifth of a percent of the total population of the country or something like that. <laughs> 500. Yeah. Yeah. So – Take the 180 times five, 900, and then take that times 100. Holy shit, 900,000 on the nose. Wow. Well, yeah, there you go. There's some watch your mouth for you. <laughs> I, I got 90. Maybe I did that wrong. Well, I'm just saying, I saw the number somewhere, and this is because people were saying, like, okay, so here's how many ICU units the U.S. has. And if 20 to 30% of the people who catch this virus require ICU to survive, uh, then it's easy to figure out how many people how 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 many people have to catch the virus before ICU is completely overwhelmed. And obviously that's that's looking at it countrywide. ICU can be overwhelmed in an outbreak area in a single city very much quicker. Yeah, and it's also time sensitive, so I mean yeah, if yeah. people yeah. people are there's going to be a turnover rate. Right. So. so to me the most effective management strategy then is you know that you've got x number of beds you know that it's pretty much going to move wherever it wants to slow it down. Yeah. Slow it down enough so that your number of active cases does not exceed the number of beds. Available. Right. So like Italy, for example, has had an explosion in cases and they are now doing the China thing where they're putting people on lockdown. Not, not it's a, they're calling it a voluntary quarantine where basically people are, you know, they've got towns there in Italy now that where, where no one's allowed to leave their houses. Can it really be called lockdown if you have prosciutto and wine? <laughs> This is a good point. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's enough on coronavirus. I just want I thought we should do an update on it. Hopefully you people listening in the future are going, yeah, yeah, that wasn't a big deal. <laughs> um, one last thing. So with infections agents like this, because this has a lot in common in a lot of ways with tuberculosis. OK. Um, also, respiratory can be really bad. Most of the time you can manage it. Um, one thing that's going to be interesting to see going forward, tuberculosis is almost non-existent in the patient population in this country. Yeah. I say patient population because that's people who see a doctor. Right. Right. Your homeless people, um, your immigrants, your less fortunate, lower income brackets in all countries, it still lives. Yeah. And with tuberculosis, the really scary kinds are multi-antibiotic resistant and there there's very few cases that ever show up but there's like super scary tuberculosis out there yeah so i wonder you know if coronavirus continues on potentially down the road 
in those populations, you know, it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, it can I mutate think, and change. Yeah. And I think one of the other big problems is there's no protocol for how to treat this yet. This is the first time it's right come it's, out in this way. And so in the future, it's much like your immune system. First time you get something, you get super sick, and then you could walk around in a hallway with people coughing on you. And so, you know, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. yeah. All right. Last thing before we take the break here. Uh, we're done with the coronavirus. I, as always, I... I go into the pre-show in the Discord chat and tell people, "All right, we're about to <clears throat> about to record the next show, so troll us now, or forever hold your peace." <laughs> and I uh, got a couple of good trolls here from the Snake Pit. I I Shaman says we need the best guest for the date of the end of everything. Um, forty <laughs> two. <laughs> 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 Great answer. <laughs> Thank you. Jeff also uh, posted his answer. He says, post CE is my guess for the end of everything. And of course, I was like, CE standing for it? And Jeff's like, common era guy. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Once common era ends, it's the end of everything. Also, a couple of things. One, one other thing. Jeff also said, I went through upheaval twice because it was so good. Velikovsky is an excellent mind. I'm really enjoying his logical points and hearing you guys' reactions to the mind-blowing evidences. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks Jeff. So yeah, everybody should check out the Discord chat. It is hopping and fun. So yeah. we got... And I have a uh, new bumper segment that I wanted to try, but I had to ask Ty if it was cool. Oh, yeah. And he finally what... responded, so let's see what he says here. Yeah, I don't give a shit. Go for it, buddy. <laughs> Just make sure you, uh, you know, let all the Snake Force know, you know, who's, who's the best at acoustic guitar, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so we will be playing a segment from a song called Epoch that's coming out on the new album whenever that happens. And this is on just processions. the acoustic guitar part. Yeah. On procession. Procession. Yeah. Yes. Snakes! Saving the trees from 50 million year old farmers <laughs> with Grease, <laughs> Brothers of the Serpent podcast, <laughs> always uh, keeping you up to date on the newest technology from the stash. <laughs> so uh, that's right. Yeah. Now we're moving on. Uh, we, we're going to start this. Yeah. Back to Earth and Upheaval. Yeah. Uh, an excellent book by Emmanuel Velikovsky. Everyone should go get it. It is available on Kindle, which is how I'm reading it. Um, you can get it for about 10 bucks on Kindle. So there is no audio version. And for, I wanted to say, for those of you listening to this, you know, because if people are going through or searching for the book and finding our podcast, I'm not reading everything. So you still need to get the book and read it because I'm, sk I'm skipping whole sections because I can't obviously read the entire book on the show. Um, maybe... We can get an audio book made of this at some point. That would be fantastic. I've been, we've been working with uh, the Grimerica guys on making audio books. And so it would be awesome if we could get this one done where I could actually read the entire thing. But for this podcast, I am reading select sections and we are discussing them. So yeah. if you want to read the whole book, which you should, you sh you've got to go get it and read it. And, um, or maybe if you can find yourself a PDF version, you can get the uh, robot reader to, to read it to you. Yeah. The auto reader. You can buy the book and then find yourself a PDF yeah, version. Buy the book and, and then steal it. <laughs> We're not, we don't condone this, but that's what you could do. So I have this, I have this thing that I like to do where I like to read the various intros to the books. And m a lot of these books have many of the many intros. So this one is no different. It has three. The first one I read was Velikovsky's preface that he wrote in 1955. The second one I read, he wrote in 1977, and this is the publisher's preface to the 1977 republishing. Okay. Okay. So the publisher says, when a book is republished after half a century, 
At first, you certainly think of antiquarian, or maybe literary, or perhaps historical interest. With the books of Emanuel Velikovsky, it is a different case. Their topicality and explosiveness have, have rather increased since their first publication, in disciplines diverse as geology, anthropology, archaeology, paleontology, astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, classical studies, Egyptology, theology, psychology, and also in theory of science. Because in all these disciplines, the first publication of his books provoked controversies unprecedented in the history of science since Galileo. At the same time, recent findings, mainly in Earth and planetary sciences, have confirmed his results and conclusions in a really impressive manner. There are only a few books which, like the present one, preserve their topicality after even half a century without changes to its text. We consider it all the more important to let the works of Emanuel Velikovsky speak for themselves and to republish them without any omissions or additions. In this way, the original work with its revolutionizing contents and its unique style will be made available to the interested readers, scientists and laymen alike, and so, hopefully, the unbiased interdisciplinary scientific discussion about Velikovsky's theories will be supported after being long overdue. Science should increase our knowledge. In the first place, this includes the open and serious discussion of facts and theories, their study, research, and, if necessary, the adjustment of the methods and paradigms to the facts, not vice versa. In this respect, the study of Velikovsky's works, and above all, the history of their accept acceptance in academic circles, can teach us a lot about our understanding of science, and, for, and from a psychological point of view, about our understanding of ourselves. Summing up, we are convinced that the republication of the complete works of Emanuel Velikovsky can give fundamental impulses for numerous, very diverse fields of knowledge, for science in general, as well as for the view of, of the, the world and of our society, and at the same time lead to a proper appreciation of the life's work of a man who, searching for knowledge and enlightenment, was personally as well as professionally confronted with the most devastating reactions. From the publisher. Paradigma Limited. Okay, so we are back to where we left off in the last podcast, and we are at... He was talking about Tiwanaku, and now he moves to Oyante Tambo. So here we go. The ancient stronghold of Oyante Tambo in Peru is built on top of an elevation. It is constructed of blocks of stone 12 to 18 feet high. These cyclopean stones were hewn from the quarry seven miles away. How the stones were carried down to the river in the valley, shipped on rafts, and carried up to the site of the fortress remains a mystery archaeologists cannot solve. Another fortress or monastery, which has a name that I cannot pronounce, in the Urumba Valley in Peru, northwest of Lake Titicaca, perches on a tiny plateau some 13,000 feet above sea level in an uninhabitable region of precipices, chasms, and gorges. It is built of red porphyry blocks. The blocks must have been brought from a considerable distance down steep, steep slopes across swift, swift and turbulent rivers and up precipitous rock faces which hardly allow a single foothold. It has been suggested that the transportation of the building blocks was feasible only if the topography of these localities was different at the time of the construction. However, definite proof in this connection is lacking, and changes in topography must be deduced from abandoned terraces, from mollusks of dried up lakes, from tilted shorelines, and other similar indications. The foothills of the Andes hide numerous deserted towns and abandoned terraces, monuments to a vanished civilization. The terraces that go up the slopes of the Andes and reach the eternal snow line and continue under the snow to some unidentified altitude prove that it was not a conqueror nor a plague that put the seal of death on gardens and towns. In Peru, aerial surveys in the dry belt west of the Andes have shown an unexpected number of old ruins and an almost incredible number of terraces for cultivation. Now, I've seen this. I've gone, I've extensively explored, quote unquote, explored Peru using Google Earth. And there are terraces all over the place yeah. in the mountains that are just, and there's no one around them. You know, there are terraces in places that are completely, on, that are miles and miles, like many tens of miles, more than that, hundreds of miles in some cases, away from areas that are inhabited. Hmm. Like uh, when I was doing research on the band of holes, remember that yep. feature? <clears throat> and so that band goes over a mile up into the arid desert. Exploring that, 
I just could see terraces off in the mountains, off to the right and to the left of this band of holes. That, you know, it's nowhere near any habited places. Because in Peru, most of the habitable places are, you can see, they're easy. Down in the valley. They're green. Yeah. Right? They have green stuff. And then everything on, they're, they're in this long valley with a river in the middle of it. And to either side is like grayish white arid highlands and deserts and plateaus. And there are terraces all through those places. So obviously the, the area there was much different when all that was being built. Yeah. I was thinking about the just the way it's stated that the blocks were quarried and then sent down the river and then hauled up the slopes. Like that's yeah, that's, that's an, an assumption. assumption. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, you have the quarry. Obviously, you know that they came from the quarry, but right. How they and at least in the case of Oyante Tambo, there are blocks that are dropped in between. Yeah, that's true. OK. And, that, and that's what I was wondering, too. I'm like, it'd be interesting to go into those rivers and like you know, with a mask and just yeah. be looking at the bottom and see all these blocks that have been dropped into the <laughs> yeah. bottom of the river. Yeah. There are the, the sleeping or tired stones. They have all these different names for them. Sleeping stones or tired stones, ones that never made it all the way up to the side. Yeah. But I'm thinking about the ones that may or may not have been dropped in the river. If they were dropped in the river, yeah. it'd be interesting to see how worn they were. Oh, yeah. To see how old they actually are. Yeah. Maybe you could sort of try to calculate how old they are. Right. Yeah. How much sediment has been pushed over top of them? Yeah, by one drop of water and one grain of sand at a time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they did this as a practice. They cut the rough stones out. They threw them in the river. Yeah, and the oldest ones that were thrown in the river were then retrieved, and they were all worn and smooth and yeah, strange, rounded, and, and they stacked them <laughs> on top of each other. That's right. Well, then the other the other place that he mentions the, of, with the name that I couldn't pronounce, uh, it's it's a name that starts with an O. It looked close to Oyante Tambo, but it had many more syllables and other letters in it that I couldn't couldn't pronounce. But anyway, that one he's saying they're saying like, no, you have to climb sheer cliffs yeah. to get there, and there's no footholds. So how did they get those blocks up you there? To build these like crane systems going up right. the mountain, right? And and if they did that, there would be you would think there would be anchoring areas that you mm -hmm. could notice. You know, if they're on sheer cliffs, you gotta drive pitons in or something. You yeah. gotta anchor your cranes. All right. <clears throat> the Columbia Plateau. Great quantities of lava flowed out in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, uh, Oregon and Idaho, where some two hundred thousand square miles were covered to depths of hundreds and even several thousands of feet. Okay. 200,000 square miles were covered in hundreds and several thousands of feet of lava. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> the Snake River, which Randall talks about a lot, the Snake River Valley, which is where he had one of his first epiphanies about scale and variance, has cut the Seven Devils Canyon more than 3,000 feet deep without reaching the bottom of these lava flows. Wow. This enormous area, embracing all the northern states between the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Coast, was flooded with molten rock and metal pouring out of fissures torn out of the ground. Certainly, it does not look like a volcanic eruption of our day, and for this reason alone, if not for a multitude of others, the principle of uniformity is definitely misleading. And he's right. We, there's no comparable volcanic... Modern analog. Right. Yeah. yeah. The depth of the lava of this vast Columbia Plateau is, quote, as great as 5,000 feet or more, unquote. Almost a mile deep. Yeah. <laughs> Even on the supposition that it was ejected in paroxysms, each time spreading a sheet only 75 feet thick, it is still enormous. And then such an ejection must have been repeated as much as 70 times in the Cenozoic Age, which is the age of mammals and man. In 1889, on the occasion of the boring of an artesian well at Nampa, Idaho, on the Columbia Plateau near the Snake River, a small figurine of baked clay was extracted from a depth of 320 feet, penetrated after piercing a sheet of basalt lava 15 feet thick. G.F. Wright described the find and wrote, quote, The well was tubed with heavy iron tubing six inches in diameter, so that there could be no mistake about the occurrence of the image, or the figure, at the depth stated, unquote. He also added, quote, No one has come forward to challenge this evidence, except on purely a priori grounds arising from preconceived notions of the extreme antiquity of these deposits. So they're coring it? 
core? In other words, or yeah. is it drilling? Because drilling would have destroyed it and turned it into powder, right? They must be coring. I guess so. Um, to get well, it's said that the drill brought the, mater- the the thing up with the material down there. Okay, I'm, th- I'm trying to imagine like a drill that's creating a six inch diameter hole somehow cutting and releasing this figurine and then moving it up without crushing it. Yeah. <clears throat> um. Yeah, I don't know. I I I have. I mean, it's a well, so they can't be coring. They must be. Yeah. Unless they, it's able to pull. Because I've seen when they drill a well, they pull out samples at certain depths and they put them on piles on the ground, right? Yeah. So that's what they were doing. And this thing was brought up. <clears throat> Maybe the, it's really small. I mean, it passed. It the, is. It's a very small figurine. It passed the drill teeth. It looks like without a, getting smashed. Yeah, it looks like a like a ginger man, gingerbread man, right? It's flat, mm. human shaped. One of the legs is broken off at the knee, probably during the drilling. Um. But this is one of my favorite uh, out-of-place artifacts. It is beneath. A basalt layer, 15 feet thick. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. So before he says, before the last lava sheet spread over the Columbia Plateau, there were human abodes in this area, or at least humans. A continent torn. Yeah, there the watcher posted a picture of it. There it is. Wow. Yeah, it's very rough, but somebody carved it. Yeah. And yeah, no one has. Uh, it's it's pretty much like I, I've I've gone onto skeptic sites to see because they have these these places on skeptic sites where they deep, quote unquote, debunk all the quote unquote, ooh parts. And for this one, <laughs> they have nothing. It's special pleading. Yeah. They basically say this can't be because it's too deep. You know, it must have slid down there or the, you know, this, this, what they think was this, uh, basalt, uh, cap was actually cracked and somehow this thing slipped all the way down to 320 feet down there. Like it can't be, it's just too deep there. It's special pleading. A continent torn apart. Africa was in tension and torn by North and South fractures, which along the sinking of a strip of the crust formed the longest, whoa, merid. Meridional land valley on Earth, from Mer- Lebanon. Meridional, meridional. Maybe that's I'm how guessing. Yeah, meridional. From Lebanon and Syria, and then almost to the Cape, there runs a deep and comparatively narrow valley, margined by almost vertical sides, and occupied by the sea, by salt steps and old lake basins, and by a series of over twenty lakes, of which only one has an outlet to the sea. This is a condition of things absolutely unlike anything else on the surface of the Earth. The author of those above lines. J.W. Gregory, the famous explorer of the Great African Rift, adopted the view that a general common cause created the entire rift from its north to its south end. The rift begins in the valley of the Orontes River in Syria. At Baalbek, it goes over the Litani River Valley, then to Lake Hula in Palestine, along the Jordan River to the Sea of Galilee, also called Gesenaret or the Sea of Tiberias, which lies in a depression below the level of the Mediterranean from there to the Dead Sea, the deepest depression on Earth, between the Judean and Moabite mountainous plateaus that were torn apart, then along the Araba Valley to the Gulf of Aqaba in the Red Sea and across the channel of this sea into Africa, thence for an enormous distance to the Sabi River in Transvaal, branching on the way eastward to the Gulf of Aden and westward to Kangakia and the Upper Nile, the rift valleys of the lake, lakes Morris and Apemba, in the central Congo, all the way from about 36 north latitude in Syria to about 28 south latitude in East Africa, in a simult- in a sinuous line along a meridian for more than a third of the way from one pole to another. Damn. It was rec- <laughs> I know, it's <laughs> enormous. It was recognized that a horizontal force of one kind or another had to be the cause of this rift valley. Quote, the simplest and earliest thought was that Africa had been pulled apart, unquote. However, another school of geologists questioned whether the rift could not have been produced under horizontal pressure, which forced the margins of the rift valley up and the valley strip down. After a long debate, the consensus res- uh, restated the view expressed by Edward Suess, or Suess, a prominent geologist at the turn of the century, quote, The opening of fissures of such magnitude can be explained only by the action of a tension directed perpendicularly to the trend of the split 
the tension being relieved in the instant of bursting, that is, of opening of the fissure, unquote. He observed also that immense floods of lava gushed out of the earth along the rift, and a most vigorous volcanic action took place. He brought to geology the now generally accepted concept of Gondwana land, a continental mass that occupied the larger portion of the Indian Ocean, and in that, and that in a relatively recent subsidence was torn apart and drowned. The subsidence of the Gondwana continent could have caused a strain on Western Asia and Africa, and under this tension, the land must have rent and the Great Rift was formed. So yeah, I've looked at the Great Rift again on Google Earth, and it's, yeah, it's, it's enormous. It's so big that it's hard to, it's hard to at first to spot it as a, a valley. Gregory concluded, quote, This widespread valley system is obviously not the result of some local fracture. Its length is about one-sixth of the circumference of the entire Earth. It must have some worldwide cause, the first promising clue to which is the date of its formation, unquote. Although Gregory thought that the rift first came into being at an early epoch because of marine fossils found in it, he also saw signs of great earth movements along the rift, quote, at a recent date. Some of the fault scarps are so bare and sharp that they must be very recent. This continuation of earth movements into the human period is one of the most striking features of this district, unquote. Gregory found also that the human memory retained recollection of the upheaval, quote, all along the line, the natives have traditions of great changes in the structure of their country, unquote. Hmm. Is it in the Indian Ocean part? Is he talking about, I think Graham talks about this, like Sunderland or something like that. This, yeah, Sunderland. Sunderland. Yeah. This massive area that's been completely covered by water. Is yeah. That, is I, that part of this rift thing? Um, I think Gondwana is like, you know, Pangea, the idea of when yeah. all the continents were together. Yeah. Gondwana is like an intermediary large collection okay. of the African plate before it splits off with from other stuff. That's Gondwana, I think. Okay. It's a it's between Pangaea and now. So but the problem with that is they're saying that the features on this rift are too recent, too recent sharp yeah. and edged. Yeah. <clears throat> so he says, what kind of force is necessary to tear apart a continent? Whence came the tension that was relieved by the bursting of the African landmass? Ice did not do this, nor the wind that erodes mountain heights, nor the rivulets that carry eroded detritus down to the sea. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 7. Deserts and Oceans. The Sahara. The Sahara Desert, which stretches from the Nile to the Atlantic Ocean across the continent of Africa and covers 3,500,000 square miles about the size of the entirety of Europe, is the greatest desert on Earth. What is now the desert of Sahara was an open grassland or steppe in earlier days. Drawings made on rock of herds of cattle, made by early dwellers in this region, were discovered by Barth in 1850. Since then, many more of these drawings have been found. The animals depicted no longer inhabit these regions, and many are generally extinct. It is asserted that the Sahara once had a large human population that lived in vast green forests and on fat pasture lands. Neolithic implements, vessels, and weapons made of polished stone were found close to these drawings. Such drawings and implements were discovered in the eastern as well as the western Sahara. Men lived in these quote-unquote densely populated regions, and cattle pastured where today enormous expanses of sand stretch for thousands of miles. Several theories have been offered to explain the prodigious quantity of sand in the Sahara. Quote, the theory of marine origin is now no longer tenable, unquote. This sand, it was found, is of recent origin. It is assumed that when a large part of Europe was under ice, the Sahara was in a warm and moist temperate zone. Later, the soil lost its moisture and the rock crumbled to sand when left to the mercy of the sun and the wind. How long ago was it that how long ago was it that conditions in the Sahara were suitable for human occupation? <clears throat> Movers, the noted orientalist of the last century, author of a large work on the Phoenicians, decided that the drawings in the Sahara were the work of those Phoenicians. It was likewise observed that on the drawings discovered by Barth, the cattle wore discs between their horns, just as in Egyptian drawings. Also, the Egyptian god Set was found pictured on the rocks. 
And there are rock paintings of war chariots drawn by horses, quote, in an area where these animals could not survive two days without extraordinary precautions, unquote. The extinct animals in the drawing suggest that these pictures were made sometime during the last ice age, but the Egyptian motifs in the very same drawing suggest that they were made in historical times. Hmm. <clears throat> What's this that was put up? Oh, Guandana. South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia all together. Okay. Botswana? Botswana. Gondwana. Man, that seems like it would be a much easier place to be. <laughs> like there's all these huge channels between these land yeah. masses. Yeah. Unless those were just filled with lava. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. It's more like a video game. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's in lava. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Gondwana. Sorry. Yeah. It, it auto-corrected him. Yeah. Arabia. There is a, quote, certainty beyond challenge that when the ice cap of the last glacial period covered a part, large part of the northern hemisphere, at least three great rivers flo flowed from west to east across the whole width of the Arabian, Arabian Peninsula, unquote. So wrote Philby in his book, Arabia. There was also a large lake in Arabia that disappeared in some geological or climatal change. At present, from Palmyra to Mecca and beyond, the Arabian Peninsula is a waterless desert, interspersed with volcanoes active not so long ago, but now extinct, the last eruption having taken place in 1253. There were also, sometime in the past, numerous geysers, all likewise extinct now. 28 fields of burned and broken stones called Haras, or Harris, I don't know how to say it, are found in Arabia, mostly in the western half of the Great Desert. Some single fields are 100 miles in diameter and occupy an area of six or 7,000 square miles, stone lying close to stone, so densely packed that passage through the field is almost impossible. The stones are sharp-edged and scorched black. No volcanic eruption could have cast scorched stones over fields as large as, the, as these haras. Neither would the stones from volcanoes have been so evenly spread. The absence, in most cases, of lava, the stones lie free of it, also speaks against a volcanic origin of these stones. It appears that the blackened and broken stones of the haras are trains of meteorites, scorched in their passage through the atmosphere, that broke during their fall, as bolides do, or upon reaching the ground. Billions of stones in a single hurrah indicate that the trains of meteorites were very large and can be classed as comets. Despite alternate exposure to the thermal action of the hot desert sun and the cool desert night, the sharp edges of these stones have been preserved, which shows that they fell in a not too distant period of time. Mm -hmm. Meteorites that fall on Earth are of two kinds. One consists of iron with an admixture of nickel. By means of this admixture with the characteristic pattern seen in the cut surfaces of such stones, their meteoric origin can be easily established. On the other group, probably larger than the first, does not differ in its composition from the rocks of the earth and cannot be distinguished unless the fall has been observed or, as in the case of the stones of the Haras, their scorched and broken condition, together with their occurrence in large fields, speak for their extraterrestrial origins. Larger bodies, bodies than the stones of the Haras fell on Arabia too. In Wobar, in the desert, there is a meteoric crater with meteoric iron and meteoric. meteoric iron and silica glass spread around it. Homo correctus. <laughs> At work. At work. <laughs> the bottom of the Atlantic. In the fall of 1949, Professor M. Ewing of Columbia University published a report on an expedition to the Atlantic Ocean. Explorations were carried on, especially in the region, uh, the region about the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the mountainous chain that runs from north to south following the general outlines of the ocean. The ridge, as well as the ocean bottom to the west and to the east, disclosed the, to the expedition a series of facts that amounts to new scientific puzzles. <clears throat> Quote, One was the discovery of prehistoric beach sand, brought up in one case from a depth of two and the other nearly three and a half miles, far from any place where beaches exist today, unquote. One of these sand deposits was found 1,200 miles from land. Wow. But there should be no coarse sand on the mid-ocean floor because sand is native to land areas and to the continental shelf, the coastal rim of the ocean and the seas. These considerations pre presented Professor Ewing with a dilemma. Either the land must have sunk two to three miles, 
or the sea must once have been two to three miles lower than now. Either conclusion is startling. If the sea was once two miles lower, where could all the extra water have gone? Unquote, which is a weird question. <laughs> where did it go? I mean, what if it wasn't there yet? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hear you're talking about it. It all showed up later, like from a comet or something. Yeah, but I, well, it's just his question of where did the water go when you're talking about something in the past? He's assuming that the water had to go somewhere, I guess is what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, it just, like, where was it stored if it wasn't? <laughs> right. Yeah. It was stored in ice yeah. somewhere. Yeah. I just don't like his time travel. He's not using his tenses right. <laughs> <laughs> I gotcha. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Where could all the extra water have gone? You could say, well, what happened to the water? Right. right. I guess. Uh, okay. So, but there was another surprise in store for this expedition. The thickness of the sediment on the ocean bottom was measured by the well-developed method of sound echoes. An explosion is set off and the time it takes for this echo to return from the sediment on the floor of the ocean is compared with the time required for a second echo to return from the bottom of the sediment from the bedrock, from the, uh, from the basalt or granite. Quote, these measurements clearly indicate thousands of feet of sediments on the foothills of the ridge. Surprisingly, however, we have found that in the great flat basins to either side of the ridge, the sediment appears to be less than 100 feet thick. Actually, the echoes arrived almost simultaneously, and the most that could be attributed in such circumstances to the set was that the sediment was less than 100 feet of thickness, which is the margin of error. Ah. So they just gave it the widest margin of error and said it's 100 feet thick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it may be actually that there's no sediment or almost none there. Hmm. So it's weird. The sediment is piled up on the slopes of the ridge line, but in the flats around it, it isn't there. Very strange. Yeah. Quote, always it had been thought that the sediment must be extremely th thick since it had been accumulating for countless ages. But on the level basins that flank the mid-Atlantic ridge, our signals reflected from the bottom mud and from the bedrock came back too close together to measure the time between them. They show the sediment in the basins is less than 100 feet thick, unquote. There are many peaks of volcanic origin scattered across the Atlantic Basin. In the direction of the Azores, the expedition found an uncharted submarine mountain 8,000 feet high with many layers of volcanic ash and farther on, a great hole dropping down 1,809 fathoms or 10,854 feet as if a volcano had caved in at some time in the past. Hmm. Like it had collapsed down into yeah. its... Uh, uh, Caldera or whatever it is. Yeah, into, well, it, it would be collapsing into the into the lava chamber. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. From the abyss of the ocean, rocks marked by, with deep scratches were raised by the expedition. In a depth of 3,600 feet, or six, 600 fathoms, we found rocks that tell an interesting story about the past history of the Atlantic Ocean. Granite and sedimentary rocks of types which originally must have come from a part of a continent. Most of the rocks we dredged here were rounded and marked with deep scratches. Such marks on rocks are regularly ascribed to the action of glaciers that held rocks in a firm grip and moved them over the surface of other rocks. But we also found some loosely consolidated mudstones so soft and weak they would not have held together in the iron grasp of a glacier. How they got out here is another riddle to be solved by further research, unquote. Hmm. So this is the area around the Azores they're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. None Seriously. of it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we ready for a break? Yep. chipping away at the uniformitarian paradigm one piece of it at a time <laughs> here on the Brothers of the Servant podcast 
Very nice. Going through our... That's a good one. <laughs> like that? Yeah. Going through our reading of Earth and Upheaval by Emmanuel Velikovsky. This is the second half yeah. of the show. Eventually, very gradually, <laughs> all the uniformitarians will come around right. to the idea of catastrophism. Yeah, exactly. That's an old used joke. You already said that one on Cosmo. I know, but all the, all, the, all the Cosmographia converts are going to be like, we heard that one already, uh, guy. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's still good though it's still good <laughs> that, I, my intro was basically a variation of that yeah I like yeah, it yeah. yeah that's why I threw it in there so we were talking during the break about the another thing that we got from Cosmographia yeah. which is if anybody has followed the uh, Atlantis series. mystery series yeah. uh, the flank failures which right. are large like massive landslides uh, from you Off know, the sides of the mountains, yeah, of the Azores and the Canary Islands, that break away and fall into the ocean, and then spread out in this large fan, covering the sedimentary layers at the bottom of that ocean with who knows? How, I don't, I don't remember how deep they were, but yeah, I don't remember. They're very deep, but they also and enormous blocks of stone from the mountainside yeah. strewn out, thousands of them, some of them thousands of feet across, covering them with breccia, yeah, broken, fractured rock. That's right. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about, and I know he's not going into all the, you know, the myths and oral traditions and, and stuff in detail in this book, but this idea of the rift, and if I understood it correctly, the, you know, this, you know, separating the landmass or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the idea that this would happen catastrophically in a very quick, you know, like very fast compared yeah. to the uniformitarian idea. Can you imagine living on in, near a place where this is taking? <laughs> no, and I was trying to think of the some of the stuff in in legends are written down in the text about the sky. You know, these horrendous sounds coming from the sky. Yeah, they're just like ah, you know, just for days and days this is going on. Yeah. And that actually, and the rumblings coming from the earth, and that right. actually being the whole continent just, yeah, just tearing open, just ripping, us. yeah, new volcanoes appearing, and enormous amounts of water pouring in from the ocean, and yeah, yeah, and it seems like that would be sending. I mean, the vibration of that occurrence alone would be creating a whole new standing wave pattern on the oceans all over the place. Yeah, there'd be massive rogue waves running back and forth all over. Yep. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So if you just ha so happen to be that guy that's like, you know, somewhere in some vast plain, nowhere near the coast, nowhere near the rift, and he's just like, God, what is that horrendous noise? <laughs> yeah. Why is the ground vibrating? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it goes on for days, weeks, yeah. possibly. God. Enormous groans and creaks and cracks and explosions and pops and that seem to come out of the sky and from the ground. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It would definitely generate myths or, or legends. Or yeah, and then you could also imagine the volcanic activity throwing up all this ash into the sky and everything. It just gets turns dark. the sun red. Yeah, yeah. And then it gets dark. And yep. That would be and scary. And then it starts raining mud. And so you're just like, <laughs> you're laying in your teepee and mud is raining down and there's thunder and lightning. And meanwhile, the ground is shaking and there's just, I mean... Yeah. What would that be like to live in? You can't go out and get food. Yep. Man. Jeez. <clears throat> okay. I don't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, finally, the very entrance to the New York Harbor, the Hudson River, was found to have a canyon running into the ocean, not only for the width of the continental shelf, which is 120 miles off of shore, as has been known for some time, but also for another hundred miles in deeper water. Quote, if all this valley was originally carved out of the river, out by the river on dry land, as seems probable, it means either that the ocean floor of the eastern seaboard of North America once must have stood about two miles above its present level, <clears throat> uh, or else that the level of the sea was once two miles lower than now, unquote. Each one of these possibilities indicates an upheaval. Velikovsky says. Yep. And that's, we also talked about that. The isostatic changes and in that 
area of the Atlantic that have the three plates. Um, right. Yeah. Converging. So that that would be the prime spot for isostatic rebound in the occurrence of some catastrophe. Yes. Right. There would be a the, the is it called the glacial four bulge or whatever it is that we're outside the glacier where it's pushing down the land. There's this bulge upwards. Yeah. Yeah. I thought, well, no, I don't know what it's I thought called. the four bulge was the glacier itself. Could the, be, The yeah. bulge, the lobe. Yeah. All but. right. The floor of the seas. In July of 1947, a Swedish deep sea expedition left Göteborg on the Albatross for a 15-month journey around the world to investigate the bottom of the seas on, set on the 17,000 miles of the ship's course with the help of a newly constructed vacuum core sampler. In the sediment... <clears throat> that covers the rocky bottoms of the oceans, the expedition found, in the words of its leader, H. Peterson, director of the Oceanographic Institute, quote, evidence of great catastrophes that have altered the face of the earth, unquote. And quote again, climatic catastrophes, which piled thousands of feet of ice on the higher latitudes of the continents, also covered the oceans with icebergs and ice fields at lower latitudes and chilled the surface waters even down th to the equator. Volcanic catastrophes cast rains of ash over the sea, unquote. This ash is preserved in the sedimentary bottom of the oceans. Quote, tectonic catastrophes raised or lowered the ocean bottom hundreds of even thousands of feet, spreading huge tidal waves which destroyed plant and animal life on the coastal plains, unquote. The bottom of the seas... And Oceans also contains evidence that the Earth was showered with meteorites on a very large scale. In many places, the bottom consists of red clay. Samples of the red clay from the Central Pacific showed a surprisingly high content of nickel and also a high content of radium, though the water of the ocean is almost completely free of these elements. The red clay is red because it contains ferruginous iron compounds, uh, meteoric iron differs from iron of terrestrial origin in its admixture of nickel, and it is this characteristic that makes it, makes it possible to differentiate iron tools of early ages, for instance, of the Pyramid Age in Egypt, and to decide whether iron pieces were smelted from ore or were worked meteorites. Quote, Nickel is a very rare element in most terrestrial rocks and continental sediments, and it is almost completely absent from the ocean water. On the other hand, it is one of the main components of metal meteorites, unquote. Thus, it is assumed that the origin of the abysmal nickel was in meteoric dust or, quote, the very heavy showers of meteors in the remote past. The principal difficulty of this explanation is that it requires a rate of accretion of meteoric dust several hundred times greater than that which astronomers who base their estimates on visual and telescopic counts of meteors are presently prepared to admit, unquote. Hmm. In a later publication, pop a popularized account of the Albatross expedition, Peterson writes, quote, Assuming the average nickel content of meteoric dust to be 2%, an approximate value for the rate of accretion of cosmic dust to the whole Earth can be worked out from these data. The result is very high, about 10,000 tons per day, or over 1,000 times higher than the value computed from counting the shooting stars and estimating their mass, unquote. Wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> so there, it's 10,000 times. What is it? 10,000 10, tons per day okay. of this dust must be put into the atmosphere in one way or another in order for the sea bottom clay to have the amount of nickel they found in it. And he is saying that that is a rate of accumulation of this kind of dust that That's is hundreds. thousands of times greater. Thousands or hundreds? Thousands. Yeah, thousands of times greater. He said over a thousand times higher than the value computed. Yeah from counting the shooting stars. Man. And they had to be big enough not to completely vaporize, I guess. Or, or So I'm wondering about that. Like, if you get this tiny dust particle that enters the atmosphere, which apparently is happening all the time, is yeah. it vaporizing all that stuff? And what happens to the elements themselves? Like, if there's nickel in it, yeah, it vaporizes, that dust but, if, but if can it, eventually make it down and it gets caught in the oceans, yeah. And it's, yeah. He's just saying that, like, even with all that included. The, so astronomers make estimates of how much of this stuff is coming onto right. the Earth at all. Yeah. So there's, but there's no nuclear reactions going on in the burning up in the atmosphere. It's all, it's all on the molecular level. 
so that you still, whatever elements were in that particle of dust are still those same elements after they burned up and exploded and eventually reached the earth. Yeah, um, mostly. I mean, I assume that there's probably, because the temperatures are so high that there are some, but I think they may be chemical changes, not nuclear ones. I don't know, though. But yeah, the energy levels are so high in some of these. Because when you go to the base elements, you can't change those until without doing fusion. Have, yeah, unless yeah. you have some type of nuclear reaction. Right. I don't think there's any fusion happening. So all of that dust, however much nickel is contained in it, is constantly raining down on the earth, and we're getting this deposition. Yeah. That's you know we could chart out and say, well, here's your regular yeah. depos deposition of nickel into the oceans. Right. But current oceans don't have this quantity of nickel in them. Right. They, they, the ocean water, you know, just doesn't contain a lot of nickel and it doesn't, and there's just not a lot of nickel on the earth either. It's right. very rare. That's cool. Yeah. And, uh, also remember that, you know, the whole thing about 10,000 tons per day, that's just because they've averaged it out over a period of time, right, in which they're right. assuming, and they're assuming that, they're assuming a whole, there's a whole bunch of assumptions, but there's a stack of assumptions there. 10,000 tons per day based on what? How long it's been accumulating? Well, how do you know how long it's been accumulating? Did you do dating? What kind of dating was it? And where did you get the stuff? Yeah. Right. But the point is, is that it may not be 10,000 tons per day. It may have, it may actually be in bursts. Right. So like yeah. the younger driest period, we have enormous amounts of it coming into the atmosphere because we're having, we're being bombarded. And then during other periods, it's not so much. So the astronomers' counts may actually be close to being accurate. For current day. For current day. Yeah. But there were periods in the Earth's past where there was enormous amounts of it coming in all plus, at once. Plus you would have the geologists looking at the layer of clay and saying the dating on that deposition is going to be this really long uniformitarian right. uh, exactly. time span. Yeah. So there's a stack of assumptions in, that, in all these numbers. Yeah. But still, he's pointing out that there was a there's a lot more, no matter how you look at it. It's just way more than they expected. And is lot. that clay made up of like volcanic ash and stuff? Or anyway, um, this, um, anyways, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he says it doesn't say what the clay is made up of. Uh, but made of red clay, and has a surprising high content of nickel. Yeah. Okay, you know. Uh, in other words, at some time or times or times, there was such a fall of meteoric dust that a portion throughout the entire age of the ocean, it would increase a thousandfold the daily accumulation of meteoric dust since the birth of that ocean. Evidence of great upheavals has been brought forth from the islands of the Arctic Ocean and the tundras of Siberia, from the soils of Alaska, from Spitsbergen and Greenland. From the caves of England, the, nor the forest bed of Norfolk, and the rock fissures of Wales and Cornwall. From the rocks of France, the Alps and the Juras. From Gibraltar and Sicily. From the Sahara and the Rift of Africa. From Arabia and its Haras. The Kashmir slopes of the Himalayas and the Siwalik Hills. From the Irrawaddy in Burma and from the Tencent and Chokutin de deposits in China. From the Andes and the Altiplano. From the asphalt pits of California, from the Rocky Mountains in the Columbia Plateau, from the Cumberland Cave in Maryland and the, uh, and the Agate Spring Quarry in Nebraska, from the hills of Michigan and Vermont with the skeletons of whales, from the Carolina coast, from the submerged coast and the bottom of the Atlantic with its ridge and the lava bottom of the Pacific. <laughs> That's the good. Uh, what was the first part of that? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Like after, before the list of all these places, he just said evidence. That's what he says. Oh, right the after evidence. The, of, yeah. Evidence of great upheavals has been brought forth from all these places. Up. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now Sorry, we're, there are other things going on around me that I'm uh, being distracted <laughs> by. <laughs> Chapter eight, poles displaced and the causes of ice ages. The origin of the glacial periods was sought on the earth below and in the heavens above. The theories that endeavored to explain what caused them fall under the following headings, astronomical, geological, and atmospherical. In the first group, some theories seek to the cause of the ice ages in space, some in the sun, some in the relative positions of the earth and the sun. One idea was that the space through which the solar system traveled was not always of equally low temperature the variations being due to gases or dust present in some areas. This idea has been abandoned. 
Another theory was that the sun is a variable star, emitting more heat at some periods and less at others. This theory also failed to be substantiated and was, and was generally rejected, yet sporadically it finds new proponents. Still, another theory would have the Ice Ages arrive when a hemisphere, the northern or the southern, happens to have its winter while the globe is at the farthest end of its ellipse, as the southern hemisphere is at present. The winter would be a little longer and colder, however, the summer, though a bit shorter, would be hotter. And if the Earth always traveled on its present orbit, the described variations would not bring about an Ice Age. It was also claimed that the terrestrial orbit becomes alternately more and less stretched. So he's talking about Milankovic cycles there. Yeah. And he's right. So right now, the Southern Hemisphere is having its winter when, with, with the way the Milankovic cycle is set right now is when it's farthest away from the sun based on the elliptical shape of the orbit. But that also means its summers are hotter because it's closest. Right. <clears throat> and those, that cycle slowly changes to In where many eventually, ways. yeah, eventually it'll be the other way around. Right. And also the... Uh, eccentricity of the orbit itself is pulsing in yeah. and outwards, and that's also shifting around the sun. Right. So it's it's complex. Hmm. But not enough to cause ice ages. Right. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Right now, though, they believe that all the stades and interstades and glacial and interglacial ages are caused by Milankovitch cycles. That's yeah. It's interesting that the because you know we're talking about the the Maunder minimum. Whatever. Yeah. The little ice age and this and solar activity. Yeah. Why is that theory abandoned? It was abandoned uh, back yeah, then. Yeah, this is the seventies or fifties. Fifties, yeah. Of the atmospheric conditions that could affect a rise or drop in temperature, the varying quantity of carbon dioxide in the air and also a du of dust particles was called on to explain the changes in temperature of the past. With the diminution of the carbon dioxide content in the air, there would be a fall in the temperature. But it was demonstrated by calculation that this could not have been sufficient to cause the Ice Age. If the Earth were enveloped in clouds of dust that kept the rays of the sun from penetrating to the ground, there would be a fall in temperature. However, one would have to explain where such extensive and thick clouds of dust in the atmosphere could come from. Quote, scores of methods of accounting for Ice Ages have been proposed and probably no other geological problem has been so earnestly discussed, not only by geologists, but by meteorologists and biologists, and yet no theory is generally accepted, unquote. A true theory of the origin of ice ages, whether resorting to astronomical, geological, or atmospheric causes, must also explain why ice ages did not occur in northeastern Siberia, the coldest place on Earth, but did occur in temperate latitudes and in a much more remote past in India, in Madagascar, and equatorial Brazil. None of the theories mentioned explains these strange facts. Hypotheses concerning warmer and colder areas in space or the variability of the sun as the source of energy, are especially inadequate to account for the geographical distribution of the ice cover. Thus, the concept of ice ages, which is established in science as one of its most definite facts, serving also as a foundation for the theory of evolution, has no explanation itself. Yeah, that's crazy. And he's right. Like, a, a minute change in the sun's output would not cause an ice age in Brazil. It just wouldn't. You know, it's equatorial. It's too... Warm. Yeah. But you take a combination of these things and it yeah. seems like you could. Right. Shifting poles. All other theories of the origin of the Ice Age having failed, there remained an avenue of approach which already early in the discussion was chosen by several geologists, a shift of the terrestrial poles. If for some reason the poles had moved from their original positions, old polar ice would have moved out of the Arctic and Antarctic circles and into new regions. The glacial cover of the Ice Age could have been the polar ice cap of an earlier epoch. Thus would be explained not only the origin of the ice cover, but also the fact that its geographical position did not coincide with the present polar circles. Quote, the simplest and most obvious explanation of a great secular changes in climate and the former prevalence of higher temperatures in northern circ circumpolar regions would be found in the assumption that the Earth's axis of rotation has not always had the same position, but that it may have changed its position as a result of geological processes such as extended rearrangement of land and water, unquote. J. Evans, a geologist, suggested that the astronomers reconsider their conclusions. And uh, he's this is, 
I skipped some stuff here. He said the astronomers are saying this can't happen. Okay. He suggests that the astronomers reconsider their conclusions on the supposition that the Earth is a shell filled with molten material. He envisaged, uh, envisaged the possibility envisaged. envisaged the possibility that under a change of load in the crust, the crust would be forced to alter its position in relation to the axis by as much as 20 degrees. Sir William Thompson, the physicist, took up the issue and retorted that, quote, the Earth cannot, as many geologists suppose, be a liquid mass enclosed in only a thin shell of solidified matter, unquote. And quote again, at the surface and for many miles below the surface, the rigidity of the Earth is certainly very much less than that of iron, and therefore at great depths the rigidity must be enormously greater than at the surface. Whatever be its age, we may be quite sure that the Earth is solid in its interior, and we must utterly reject any geological hypothesis which assumes the solid Earth to be a shell of 30 or 100 or 500 or 1,000 kilometers thickness resting on an interior liquid mass, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> ah, physicists were wrong back in the 50s. <laughs> well, what he's saying is that it can't be liquid all the way to the center. Oh, okay. He's like, I don't care how thick you make the shell. It can't be floating on a on a completely liquid interior. That wouldn't work physically. Oh, okay. all right, I misunderstood. Well, he hasn't, yeah, I haven't finished it. So Lord Kelvin showed that if the Earth were a liquid mass covered with a solid crust, quote, this solid crust would yield so freely to the deforming influence of sun and moon that it would simply carry the waters of the oceans up and down with it. In other words, the whole thing would pulse and there would be no tides, right? Hmm. And there would be no sensible tidal rise and fall of water relatively to it. The state of the case is shortly this. The hypothesis of a perfectly rigid crust containing liquid violates physics by assuming preternaturally rigid matter and violates dynamical astrono astronomy. He admitted, however, that, the that a larger shifting of the poles would be possible if the Earth had a solid nucleus in the interior separated by a liquid layer from the outer crust. Okay. This he regarded as improbable. And directed his argument against the Earth of the molten interior. <laughs> but now that is the, right, that is the theory. Yeah. That we have a, there's a solid inner core, and then the outer core is metal, but is liquid, and then there's a big, thick liquid mantle, a plastic mantle. Yeah, but I, but I would also say that his argument that uh, the whole Earth would sort of undulate with the tides, and, and so there wouldn't be any... That's assuming that the viscosity of the interior is the same as the water. Yeah. The water is... Much yeah. lower viscosity than than magma. Yeah. Yeah, you're Especially right. Especially like highly pressurized magma in the mantle and all that. So yeah. it would resist flow more yeah. so, so there than there would the be water. tides, but he's saying that they wouldn't be as great. Yeah. But yeah, I think you're right. He's is a little weird. But I, I so but once you've got a, a solid iron ball in the middle, now all that stops, and you can't have even though you've got so you've got two solid things, a solid shell separated from a solid core by a bunch of liquid and plastic material. Now it's a lot more rigid because of that solid interior. Right. Right. But it does still yeah, there's undulate in that way. There, yeah. there, you know, that's yep. what isostasy is, is basically yeah. the, the movement of magma underneath the crust. Yeah. Laterally. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just love this whole fight that they're having in this, you know. <laughs> Quote, mathematicians may seem to geologists almost churlish in their unwillingness to admit a change in the Earth's axis. Geologists scarcely know how much invo is involved in what they ask. So this is a quote from a mathematician. Okay. And he's basically saying, like, you guys don't know what you're talking about. They do not seem to realize the vastness of the Earth's size or the enormous quantity of her motion. When a mass of matter is in rotation about an axis... It cannot be made to rotate about a new axis except by ex external force. Internal changes in this object cannot alter the axis, only the distribution of the matter in motion about it. If the mass began to revolve about a new axis, every particle of the object would begin to move in a different direction. What is to cause this? Where is the force that could deflect every portion of it and every particle of the Earth into a new direction of motion okay so there's a video uh multiple videos of this but online where i guess these russian cosmonauts are like unscrewing this little t-handled yeah thing 
Yeah. Right? Because <clears throat> it has multiple axes. That's why it does those flips. Well, the axis of rotation is still one. Yes. Right? It's rotate. So it, it unscrews from the thing and then it starts to wobble because its distribution of, of mass yeah. is, is not yeah. perfectly centered, right? So once it, the wobble gets big enough, then it goes through this really quick catastrophic switch where it it Flips doesn't over. but this is the thing it doesn't it doesn't alter the axis of rotation by any degree it, it's it alters it by 180 degrees yeah right and that uh, that flip happens very quickly yeah and then it spins for a while there and then, and it, then it, flips it flips back, back over. over yeah so you've got multiple rotations and then like in one or two rotations, it flips the axis 180 degrees, rotates yeah. like that multiple times, and then in one or two rotations, flips it back over. Yeah. So I thought of that in terms of the, you know, this this processional wobble that we have. Yeah. So you, and then there's the idea that the axis, you know, they say, well, the, the axis is changing in degrees. Yeah, there's a nod or whatever. A nod. Yeah. And trying to imagine how this nod can go out to, whatever it is now, 22-ish degrees, and then back. Up to 18 or something. And then back yeah. down without the 180-degree flip yeah. seems it does strange seem to weird. me. How, yeah. What's stopping it from getting wider? Right. And then reversing that direction. Yeah, that's a lot of changes in force. You're, you're yeah. right, yeah. It seems like it would go the full cycle all the way to 180 and then start to widen out again yeah. and then and go flip, flip over the 180. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. Yep. So and it, and you're right. And so a, a system like that, the Earth may completely reverse its its rotation because it's not changing the axis. The axis itself is flipping over. Right. Right. So you don't end up with a with a with a you don't end up with the axis leaving the poles. Exactly. So, but if you were to take a snapshot of it in the middle of that flip, it would be <laughs> kind of confusing, right? Yeah, like, what's happening be. here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Further developments showed that the tides in the terrestrial crust under the influence of moon and sun, unknown to Lord Kelvin, do exist, though they are minute. This means that the Earth is not perfectly rigid. It was also found that the Earth makes a real wobbling motion. S.C. Chandler, an American astronomer, explained that the wobbling of the Earth as an indication of its being removed from its balanced position. Mm-hmm. G. V. Sharpelli, uh, Sharpelli, yeah. The Italian astronomer, in his research, uh, pointed out that in the case of the displacement of the pole, inertia and the new pole of rotation would describe circles around each other, and the Earth would be in a state of strain. <clears throat> Quote: The Earth is at present in this condition, and as a result, the pole of rotation describes a small circle in 304 days, known as the Eulerian Circle. Unquote. This phenomenon of wobbling points to a displacement of the terrestrial poles at some point in the past. The question centers then on the forces that could have caused such a shift. How many days? 304 days. So the pole... Uh, okay. The pole of rotation describes a small circle in 304 days. Wow, that's weird. I wonder if it's also uh, precessional. Yeah, or is it, it going... probably is. It has to go the other way. From the rotation of the Earth. So there's itself. a small and a large precession. Yeah. Wheels of thin wheels. Oh. Okay. The sliding continents. In August of 1950, the British Association for the Advancement of Science devoted the sessions of its annual convention to debate on the question, is the theory of the continental drift right or wrong? There were many defenders of the theory and just as many opponents. The theory was then put to a vote. The result was an even division between yay and nay, and the chairman was entitled to cast the deciding vote, but he vote, but he abstained. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. So the uh, let's see, I was trying to do some math here. Yeah. Um, so we got we take procession just to see what's going. So twenty five thousand nine hundred and twenty years times three sixty five. What's what's a better Four, estimation? Three sixty-five point two four or something. Point two four. Okay, 
9,467,020.8 days. Divide that by 304 days. Yeah. Is what the that is. Okay. And then divide that again. Well, why did I do that? <laughs> but is that right? I'm trying to figure out how many times this happens. In one processional rotation? So the number I got is 85, but I think I'm doing something wrong. Because it's 304, it would be... Yeah, you, don't need to divide, you don't need to divide it again. Because the first number yeah, is yeah, years you're right, you're and right, the second right. one is days. You're right. That's right. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it does it 31,141 times. Hmm. 25. Okay. Strange. I'm just trying to figure... I just wanted to see if there <laughs> yeah. was any yeah. weird connection there, but it's a long decimal number, too. Yeah. Uh, well. Doesn't... No. Not, not ringing a bell. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, we need to take a break. Let's go ahead and do it. Yeah. So I can go to this at the end there. Yeah. All right. Shortest two hours in podcasting for our <laughs> final segment of the final four minutes of our two hours. <laughs> Doing bad water math and uh, disrupting the reading of segments of Earth and Upheaval. Yep. Uh, pretty fascinating stuff. Uh, it's always good to try out some water math, though, <laughs> on the fly. <laughs> Doing it not live on the show. That's right. I really wanted to find some similarity in there. Yeah. With uh, processional numbers, but nope. Not yet. All right. The theory of drifting continents, debated since the 1920s, has its starting point in the similarity of the shapes of the coastlines of Brazil and Africa. This similarity, or better, a complementation, plus some early faunal and floral affinities, suggested to Professor Alfred Wegner of Graz in Styria... Uh, Styria, that in an early, early geological age, these two continents, South America and Africa, were one landmass. But since animal and vegetable affinities could also be found in other parts of the world, Wagner conjectured that all continents and islands were once a single landmass and that in various epochs divided and drifted apart. Those who do not subscribe to the theory of continental drift continue to explain the affinity of plants and animals by land bridges or former land connections between continents and also between continents and islands. In order that continents might move, it is claimed that there must be a basic difference between the composition of the Earth's crust that is exposed in land masses and that which exists on the bottom of the ocean. The theory of drifting continents is grounded on the increasingly well-proven doctrine of isostasy or the flotation of the crust of the Earth on plastic magma. Yep. Besides accounting for the correspondence between the coastal features of eastern South America and western Africa, and between those of other continents, and certain affinities in the animal and plant kingdoms, the theory of drift tries to account for several geological phenomena, all in need of explanation. One, the cause of the ice ages. Two, the distribution of coal beds. And three, the formation of mountains. Or what is that? Or orogenesis. Orogenesis. The occurrence in an early glacial period of ice cover in lands now in tropical and subtropical regions is explained by the supposition that these lands were once in the Antarctic. However, their extent is so great that if all of them were joined around the South Pole, many parts that have signs of the Ice Age would be still too remote from the pole. The theory assumes, therefore, that these lands occupied in succession the position of the Antarctic continent today, each in its turn passing through a glacial period. The signs of glaciation in Africa, India, Australia, and South America are accounted for by the successive sliding of these continents through the southern polar region. 
The minute difference between the gravitational pulls to which the crust is subjected in higher latitudes and closer to the equator was offered by Wagner as the motive force in the drift of continents. But Harold Jeffries, a British cosmologist, computed that this force is 100 billion times too weak to produce this effect. Quote, There is therefore not the slightest reason to believe that bodily displacements of continents through the lithosphere are possible, unquote. Even assuming that this motive force was sufficient, why did the lands of Europe, Siberia, and North America first move away from the original common land mass towards the equator and then retreat from that equator? Um, the assumption that ocean floors and continents are eternally different in structure is in contradiction to a great number of observations, though the land surface has been better explored than the bottom of the sea, the idea of a basic difference between the rocks of the ocean bottom and those of the continents is disproved wherever the fossiliferous continent contents of the land and of the ocean bed are examined. Marine expeditions have failed to find at various places on the ocean bottom the thick layers of sediment that should have been present if the sea had been covering those areas for untold centuries. On the other hand, sediments thousands and even tens of thousands of feet thick have been found on the continents. <laughs> Not only were large stretches of land in North America and Europe and Asia covered by the sea at various times in the past, and some well-investigated investiga localities like the gypsum beds of Paris show repeated returns of those waters, but even the largest and highest mountain chains, the Alps, the Andes, and the Himalayas, at some time were under the sea. Since the ocean once covered a vast expanse of now dry land, it may at present occupy the place of former dry land. The land masses of today do not change their latitudes. The mode of force claimed is insufficient by far. Coal beds in Antarctica and recent glaciation in temperate latitudes of Southern Hemisphere all conspire to invalidate the theory of wandering continents. Hmm. <clears throat> but I thought, I thought the uh, this is mid-Atlantic rift was like they can measure like it's growing at the rate of like a fingernail or something. Yeah, yeah. The land is being so. Is that wrong? Is he saying there is well, I mean, no measure, remember, measurable? Remember again that this is this is the, written in the time when the debate about this was happening fiercely. Yeah. So I, obviously he's not on the side of the continental continental drift. But yes, yeah. the drifting is explained by this extremely slow movement of the of the material coming out of the mid Atlantic Rift. But there's no, you know, it, it, they they see these different layers of uh, different. It's not layers; they're bands of material that are quote unquote older as they go out away from the rift. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking that that accounts for that. That is actually pushing everything, but it doesn't necessarily have to be working that way. That stuff can be sliding over stuff that's underneath it. Yeah, that's true. So the earth experiences the precession of the equinoxes or a large spin of the axis with cons uh, consequent displacement of the seasons in relation to the perihelion or the point on the orbit closest to the sun. This precession or preceding of the vernal and autumnal equinoxes is as great as 50.2 uh, seconds a year. And the terrestrial axis describes a wide circle in the sky in a period estimated at about 26,000 years. Newton explained this phenomenon, known since the days of Hipparchus, as produced by the attractive effect of the sun and the moon on the bulging part of the equator. But this explanation does not account for what, in the first place, caused the Earth's bulging part, or equator, to take the position under an angle to the plane of terrestrial revolution, or the ecliptic. Hmm. I've never heard that before, but that still, it's, that, that's interesting. Like, it's, it's bulging out at the equator, and so during a solstice, the sun's attractive, you know, gravitational attraction and the moon, since the moon is more in... Uh, and closer the to the ecliptic is trying to straighten the axis. Yeah. At at both solstices, it's trying to pull the the yeah. um, equator closer to itself. Right. And so that would probably overcorrect. Right. It would go. It would go. Yeah. Towards the sun, and then eventually it would keep going, and until it started to pull it back, and that might be what the what knot is. The about. knot is. Yeah. The swing. This swing of the terrestrial axis as though the globe were atop disturbed in its motion 
could also be caused by a disturbance in the motion of the Earth experienced sometime in the past. And see, this is what I've thought that like it does seem like you spin a top, it spins perfectly. And then if you f tap it, it starts doing this same processional wobble. Yeah. Or if it starts doing it once it slows down and can't keep up the. Yeah. Can't hold its own weight up straight. Right. By the way, the watcher says the plates are still moving apart. So the Atlantic is growing at the ridge at a rate of about 2.5 centimeters per year in an east west direction. Right. So. But the way he says it, so is it is it is the Atlantic is growing the width, at the ridge? The entire width of the Atlantic growing by by that much? Mm -hmm. Or is it just the land at the ridge moving apart? And also, is it is the Atlantic growing because the plates are moving apart? Or is that ridge growing out and pushing those plates apart? That's the that's yeah. the question. He says it implies all of that. Yes, <laughs> all of that is correct. <laughs> All right. Finally, we have already spoken of the wobbling of the terrestrial axis or it's describing a small circle around the geographical pole or better of the wandering of the pole that causes small variations in latitudes, which was discovered late in the 19th century. More recently, M. Milankovic introduced the third variable, the obliquity of the ecliptic, to correct some of the de defects of Kroll's theory. In the opinion of his crit critics, however, his curve of climatic changes widely upsets geological dates, nor do his variables offer sufficiently effective reasons for the vigorous changes of climate. Besides, he assigned an arbitrarily, arbitrary length to the oscillation period of obliquity. And why were there no ice ages during long periods in the past if the process recurs at calculable intervals? Thus, the inquiry turned once more to more radical change, the displacement of the terrestrial crust in relation to the core. Hmm. To the study of isostasy and its anomalies, gravitation is strangely stronger over the deep oceans. F. A. Uh, Venning Mintz, Dutch geophysicist and explorer of oceans, made many important contributions. He found in the very structure of the terrestrial crust signs of some violent displacements on a global scale. Thus, it is not merely in order to explain the climates of the past that the, that the dislocation of the crust is postulated. In 1943, Venning minced, uh, analyzed the, quote, stresses brought about by a change in position of the rigid Earth's crust with regard to the axis of rotation of the Earth, unquote. In this analysis, he surmised that the crust, he surmised the crust, quote, to have the same thickness everywhere and to behave as an elastic body, unquote. He pointed out that if we assume that the crust happened to move clockwise in relation to the core by over 70 degrees, the expected effect quote, shows a remarkable correlation to many major topographic features and also to the shearing patterns of large parts of the Earth's surface, as in the North and South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, and the Gulf of Aden, Africa, the Pacific, etc. If the correlation is not fortuitous and this, not, and this does not appear probable, we have to suppose that the crust of the Earth at some moment of its history has indeed shifted with regard to the Earth's poles and that the crust has undergone a corresponding block shearing. Unquote. Hmm. So he's saying that if it moved a bunch, that all of a sudden all these strange, very large geomorphic features line up with the kind of shear forces that would be put onto the Earth's crust as a whole if it moved, like crustal shifting. Yeah, so that's still the axis of rotation is staying in place, but the crust is sliding around. Right. Yeah, or portions of the crust are sliding. Right. Okay, so Watcher's saying the spreading a part of the plates is creating gaps for the magma to fill in in the Atlantic. Right? I see. Okay. So it isn't pushing it. Something else is pulling. Something else is causing the continents to move around, and that is making the uh, hmm. magma ability to come out. So that's different. Yeah. All right. We are fully justified in concluding that the lithosphere was displaced during the Great Ice Ages, and that the displacements were the direct cause of the alterations in climate during these periods, unquote. The author of these lines, K.A. Pauli, propagates the idea offered or revived by the astronomer A.S. Eddington in his paper, The Borderland of Geology and Astronomy. According to Ed Eddington, the Ice Ages were caused by the shifting of the Earth's outer crust over its interior as a result of tidal friction or the inequality of lunar pull on various layers of the Earth, 
This theory abandons every effort to find in the Earth itself the force that might cause the crust in its entirety to change its position in relation to the terrestrial axis, which, in this theory, maintains its astronomical direction. So I think that what, the, what all this is pointing to is that whether the Earth itself flips over on its axis or the crust slides around, the forces that cause that have to be external. Yeah. The theory of the sliding lithosphere shares the quantitative inadequacy of the theory of sliding continents. Some mode of agent more powerful than tidal friction or gravitational differences at various latitudes or intermittent radioactivity in the Earth must have been at work in order to move continents or the entire lithosphere. Thus, these theories meet the fate of the earlier theory that postulated the shifting of the poles because of a geological redistribution of land and sea. Also, the theory that would explain the displacement of the crust by an asymmetric growth of the polar ice caps is quantitatively indefensible. This theory uses the same phenomenon, the growing ice caps, as the cause and the effect of ice ages. <laughs> That's right. If this is if you're trying to explain ice ages by this, you can't use it to make the effect. It can't be both, right? Mm -hmm. The present survey of theories which are quantitative, quantitatively inadequate yet based on the well-reasoned principle of a change of latitudes or the direction of the axis as the cause of the ice ages was here undertaken to make clear that thoughtful researchers among geologists, climatologists, and astronomers were unsatisfied with views that would not solve the problem of the geographical distribution of the ice cover in the past, a point which almost all other theories are strangely oblivious. It follows, then, that the clamor heard at the publication of Worlds in Collision, even from some astronomers and geologists, to the effect that the shifting axis or changing latitudes had never been heard of, is not supported by scientific literature. <laughs> I like that. That Basically, that whole section was him responding to a bunch of people like, no one ever said that. That's never been heard of before. And he's like, actually, lots of people have been talking about this <laughs> for over 100 years. <laughs> W.B. Wright of the Geological Survey of Great Britain finds that the only way to explain ice ages is to assume that, that, quote, the Earth's axis of rotation has not always had the same position. And it has since now become obvious that geological history has witnessed many changes in the position of the climatic zones on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, and that at least one notable glaciation, that of the Permo Carboniferous, which preceded the time of the large reptiles, was due to a displacement of the pole from its present position, and it becomes worthwhile to inquire whether the quater quaternary or recent glaciation would not have had a similar cause, unquote. Hmm. Okay. So they, I know that they have, they, they extract uh, materials from cores that have different magnetic poles you know, like it's obvious that the yeah. magnetic pole had shifted. Yeah, from the Atlantic seabed specifically. Yeah. yeah. Do you think all this is connected? Like, yeah, if the so. axis shifts, the magnetic pole is going to shift along with it. Well, if the axis shifts and the magnetic pole doesn't shift, then you'll show a reversal. That's true. Yeah. Either way. Yeah. Because the magnetic pole, if it's being generated by the interior of the Earth, and the axis shift is actually a crustal shift. Right. Yeah. So what they may be looking at in those all those shifts down there of magnetic stuff is actually a crustal slide rather yeah. than a ma ma magnetic uh, reversal. You know, but they're assuming it's magnetic reversal because the idea of the whole crust sliding over. But I don't know, you know, uh, there's some weird stuff with um, I'm just remembering this, but there's some weird stuff with like pieces of pottery. I can't remember where this was, but there are pieces of pottery that were found where you know, when the pottery was fired, it, it, it freezes stuff into position, just like magma coming up and cooling. And they found that the um, and because you know that that pots are fired standing up. Right. You can calculate the uh, magnetic field in them. And some of them seem to be reversed. So interesting stuff there, hmm. like like the, the pole shift, a magnetic pole shift of some kind or something has happened in the very recent past. Yeah. Or it was a magnetic anomaly in the space place where they were doing the firing right yeah could be that too i still I, you know i have this 
my bias for artifacts and and uh, uh, ancient structures being older rather than younger conflicts with this idea of <laughs> <laughs> crustal shift being recent. Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to let it be recent because <laughs> then that makes all of the all of the structures have to be more recent than than that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, if if there was a big crustal shift. All of these aligned structures had to have been built afterwards. Right. And I just, uh, so that, so then the question is, is when did the crustal shift happen? But yeah, like, you, you, you know, a crustal shift is going to be enormously devastating. Yeah. Even if it takes place over many decades. Yeah, it would just be hard to believe at all that not only, not only the alignments, but just the structures themselves would remain after yeah. such an upheaval. Right. But I don't doubt that. Maybe that's why these like this these ancient peoples in Peru who ever built all that stuff they built they use such enormous stones with no they're you know and they're dry laid and polygonal because if it was like a decades long shift and everything is just rumbling all the time those structures would survive that yeah, that's why they're so smooth that's why their joints are so <laughs> they've tight. been they've been rubbed down it's yeah. like hey if we start building this stone building in the middle of this vibrating earth <laughs> then by the time the vibrating earth is done these structures will look really badass. <laughs> It'll make us look like the most awesome stonemasons ever. Right, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, chapter nine, axis shifted, earth in a vise. Harold Jeffries... A vice. A vice. Harold Jeffries asks, asks in his book, The Earth, quote, has the inclination of the earth's axis to the plane of its orbit varied during its history, unquote. And he proceeds, quote, the answer to this question is a definite yes. The theory of tidal friction assumes the equator and the plane of the Earth's and Moon's orbits to coincide. And the fact is that they do not, unquote. The Moon, as it is, it is assumed, issued from the equatorial region of the Earth by the process of disruption and must therefore revolve in the plane of the terrestrial equator. But since it does not, there must have been a displacement of either the moon or of the terrestrial axis. And the position of the moon close to the plane of the ecliptic suggests that the terrestrial, terrestrial axis is the one that suffered the displacement. Mm -hmm. Also, if from the beginning there was a difference in the direction of the axes of terrestrial rotation and lunar revolution, this difference must have disappeared as the result of tidal friction. Jeffries considered the works of George Darwin, who tried to explain the observed positions by recourse to several additional tidal frictions, but he found a flaw in Darwin's hypothesis. Any internal changes in the Earth would not be not important for the observed change in the direction of the terrestrial axis. Jeffries says, quote, If we consider the axis of the Earth's angular momentum, this can change direction only through couples acting on the Earth from outside, unquote. Explain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it, like it's there are more stacks of assumptions here, but like if the moon was extruded from the Earth in some very ancient cataclysm, right, pre-life a cataclysm, so the moon comes from the Earth, then it would be orbiting it in the in the uh, terrestrial equator, right? But it doesn't. It actually orbits in the plane of the ecliptic mostly, yeah, closer to the plane of the ecliptic, a lot closer. Yeah, yeah. Which means that. One or the other had to have been disturbed at some point in the past. Right. And since the moon is close to the plane of the ecliptic, it seems more, it likely, seems more that... likely that the Earth is the one that was disturbed. Right. And then the very end there, he's just saying that, like, any disturbance of this kind would require outside forces. Okay, that's what, yeah. Yeah. Watcher says there were, there were the tax jars in Jerusalem from 3,000 years ago that had the wrong magnetic. Mm. Of course. <laughs> the tax jars. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, sue them. It's been 3,000 years. <laughs> Audit those jars. <laughs> Evaporating oceans. If we take into account the area occupied by ice in the glacial epoch, much larger than the area of the present polar ice, we must conclude that the shifting of the poles alone cannot explain the origin of the glacial cover. The expansion of the glacial cover in its various stages is supposed to be known. The usual estimate of its thickness is between six and 12,000 feet. From these figures, the mass of the ice is calculated and the quantity of water necessary to produce it. 
The water must have come from the oceans, and it is estimated that the surface of the oceans must have been at least 300 feet lower when the ice cover was developed. So we know today that it was 400 to 500 feet. Yeah. Some estimates double, triple, and quadruple and even increase sevenfold this figure. But for all the oceans to have evaporated to such an extent, turning many areas of the continental shelf into deserts of sand and shells, an enormous amount of heat was necessary. John Tyndall, a British physicist of the last century, wrote, quote, Some eminent men have thought, and some still think, that the reduction of temperature during the glacial epoch was due to a temporary diminution of solar radiation. <clears throat> Others have thought that in its motion through the space, our system may have traversed regions of low temperature, and that during its passage through these regions, the ancient glaciers were produced. Many of them seem to have overlooked the fact that the enormous extension of glaciers in bygone ages demonstrates just as rigidly the operation of heat as well as the action of cold. Cold alone will not produce glaciers, unquote. Hmm. He calculated that for every pound of vapor produced, a quantity of heat is required sufficient to raise five pounds of cast iron to the melting point. Yeah. In order to evapor evaporate the oceans and transform the water into aqueous clouds that would later descend as snow and turn to ice, a quantity of heat was needed that would raise, the melting, raise to the melting point a mass of iron five times greater than the mass of the ice. Tyndall argued that the geologists should substitute the hot iron for the cold ice and they would get an idea of the high temperature immediately preceding the ice age and the formation of the glacial cover. If this is so, then none of the theories offered an explanation to the Ice Age really would account for it. Even if the sun disappeared and the Earth lost its heat to cosmic space, there would be no quote-unquote Ice Age. The oceans and all the water would freeze in place, but there would be no ice formation on land. Yeah, that's a really good <clears throat> point. The importance of heat in the formation of the ice cover of the Ice Age was stressed even more by another author, an astronomer of our day, D. Menzel of the Harvard Observatory. Quote, if solar variability caused the ice ages, ice ages, I should prefer to believe that increased warmth brought them on, whereas a diminution of heat caused them to stop, unquote. Hmm. Yeah, because it, it requires heat to vaporize the water. To bring it to the poles. To take it to the poles. Yeah. <clears throat> so that that is really strange. And then uh, we, were, we were talking about this with Randall recently about how... There's this, this you have, paradox. You have to add all of this snow fall basically to to the glacier where the glacier is being created and then that increased pressure and weight of the new snows compacting on top of the glacier is pushing the margins of the glacier down yep until it starts to melt and so then you have the um glacial recessional uh, or the glacial recession at the margin and it's happening at a certain rate and that rate has to be less than the amount of buildup at the pole. Right. The amount of accumulation. Or, or accumulation at wherever it's accumulating. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's not just a... Yeah, there's the zone of accumulation and the zone of ablation. Oblation, yeah. So it's not just that you have to have enough snow, snowfall or whatever to build this glacier in the size that we know that they, they reached. You have to be... Doing that at a greater rate continuously as it's also melting at the margins. Right. You have to either <laughs> be, crazy. it has to be either greater than or equal to the rate of ablation in order to maintain the size of the glaciers. Right. Yeah. And to push them forward, it has to be greater. And so you have to say, where did all this water, all this snowfall come from? Where it has to be evaporated from the oceans and the lakes and stuff around the world. So you need a ton of heat to do that. Right. So you need the, you need the cold to provide the cold so that the glaciers can survive, but you need a lot of heat elsewhere in order to move all that water to the poles. So what can do this? <laughs> Giant impacts. <laughs> 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 they provide all the heat at once. Hmm. And then they provide cold because of the dust cover. And then all that water in the atmosphere that was put up there by the impact... Yeah, and it seems poles. like you. I don't know. It I'm seems just, like you would still need it to be multiple, multiple impacts, a bombardment of yeah, impacts over yeah, a long right. period of time. Yeah, yeah. You need this because the glaciers have to build up fairly slowly. You can't just immediately <laughs> vaporize all the enough water to build those glaciers. Yeah, I don't know. 
I don't know. You're right. I mean, I don't know. Because like he was saying, if you... It, if the Let's only say, thing that I could think of that provides heat and cold at once is an impact. Yeah, I know. But I'm, I'm just saying, <laughs> like, what his point was is that you have, if, if, if the temperature dropped enough, then the oceans would just freeze in place. Yeah. So you have to have sort of, like, you need that quick influx of, of heat. Yeah. Right? And that's going to cause so much glacier building. Yeah. But then there has to be some sort of system that maintains it after that. Or something. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I guess I'm suggesting that one impact, it seems unlikely that one impact would cause that much yeah. glacier growth at once. So, But if you had a steady bombardment of impacts over the course of hundreds of years, yeah. you could surpass, well, silly, you have to get to the, <clears throat> you surpass a threshold where, where it can actually sustain itself, right? Yeah. So now you have your glaciers as big as they're going to get, and they just stay that big as the Earth returns to its normal. Yeah. Well, the watcher, yeah, the watcher saying some cool stuff here. Volcanism. So that that may provide it. So the impact impacts crack the surface, and you ro- result in all these volcanoes in the bottoms of the oceans. Yeah. yeah. So the initial, or even just next to them, and they're dumping lava into it. Right. Yeah. Right? That's a good point. So you ha- so now you have. Su- you have like extreme cold because of all the crap that's been thrown up in the air by the initial impacts. Much, much higher than the melting point of iron. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Need a lot less poundage. Right. So all the the impacts provide an initial burst of heat, put a ton of water and dust up in the air, and then provide the cold. And then resulting volcanism could, provides continuous steam. Yeah. Whole, er, whole areas of ocean, deep, shallow oceans have vault lava all over their floors, and there's lava dumping into the oceans yeah, from yeah, areas. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, very good. There we go. Mystery solved. So that's a, that's what I meant is that the <laughs> the um, yeah the uh, magma like the guy was putting it in terms of of taking iron to its melting point. Yeah, yeah. So you need five pounds of iron to the melting point. Well, magma is way, way hotter. hotter than that. Yeah, yeah. So you need much less weight in terms of magma. Right. Yeah. He's just talking about the energy amount. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but but yeah, he, yeah. But his example, I mean. You could have just as easily used magma, (laughs) right? And it would have been a lot less poundage. (laughs) Right. So condensation, getting close to the end here of the show. In the preceding section, it was made clear that for the ice cover of the glacial epoch to be formed, evaporation of the oceans on a large scale must have occurred. But evaporation of the oceans would not be enough. Rapid and powerful condensation of those vapors must have followed. Quote, We need a condenser so powerful that this vapor, instead of falling in liquid showers to the earth, shall be so far reduced in temperature as to as to descend as snow, unquote. In the struggle between heat and cold, snow would descend in some parts of the world and torrential rains in others. And in fact, numerous scientists who conducted their field study in various areas outside the former ice cover came to the conclusion that those areas had experienced periods of torrential rains that were simultaneous with the glacial periods in higher latitudes. <clears throat> Gregory, studying the African continent, observed signs of water action on a great scale at the same time that other areas were being covered by advancing ice. There, remains, there remained in the Sahara and adjacent regions stream channels, quote, not now occupied by watercourses, unquote, that obviously carried great quantities of water. Quote, it is believed probable that these streamways were trenched during a pluvial age or pluvial ages. So caused by rainfall. Yeah. In the pluvial Lake Victoria in Africa stood over 300 feet above its present level. Since that time, there was a complete reversal of the river system in the region. Shore Cole, a salt lake in Sinkiang, had its level 350 feet higher than it is today. Lake Bonneville, which occupied parts of Utah, Nevada, and Idaho, and collected pluvial water as well as meltwater from the local glaciers in the mountains, stood, quote, more than 1,000 feet above the present Great Salt Lake, unquote. Hmm. And I think that's where we're going to have to stop. Yeah. Still in Chapter 7? Uh, I don't Can't know. remember. <sighs> that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think you got, I think you nailed it, Watcher. Yeah. It makes, makes sense. Yeah, minus you, your minus your vacuum tunnel to space. Everything else is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you bring you, you got the impact, which disturbs the crust, breaks it apart. You have, and then of course, all of that causes 
dust cover, so you get the cold. Yeah. But down at the surface, you've got all this heat. Yeah. And the heat's being provided now from the interior of the Earth, so you, yeah. have, a, you have a heat sink there. Yeah. yeah. It's a cascade of catastrophes. And that vapor would normally warm the atmosphere. Right. But instead, because of the, the so much mass dust. amounts of dust, you get this, like initially you'll have all this uh, mud rain creating loess or lus. Yeah. And the rest of it would, would go up into the poles and freeze. And yes. Fall. That's right. Mystery solved. <laughs> All right, you guys can get a hold of us. As you know, brothersoftheserpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, brothersoftheserpent.com, where you can find the In Snakelopedia and the Glossary of Terms and the Snake Skins, which is our merchandise store. Uh, you can also find the Pyramid Scheme there, where you can support us and support the show. So you can join the Pyramid Scheme through Patreon or by a one time donation on PayPal. And anybody that does that really helps out the show and helps us get better equipment and helps us go straight to Pyramids. Yeah. And we, we really appreciate everybody who has been doing that. Thank you guys so much. Yes, yes, yes. Also, Thank give you. us reviews. Go to iTunes. Look us up on Apple Podcasts and post a review. Really helps spread the show because it gets us up in the charts there. Uh, share the show anywhere you can. Join, uh, Follow us on Twitter at Snake Bros. No Bowels, S-N-K-B-R-S. Join the Facebook group, which is run by Jordan. Join the Discord chat, which you can find a link to on the website. Uh, also, check out the Library of the Serpent, which is run by Jeff. A lot of books and other materials that we talk about and pa- scientific papers and everything that all are pertinent to things we have discussed on the show are in the Library of the Ser- Serpent, which is run by Jeff, and he also runs the Discord chat. Don't forget about History Shift. He makes all of our YouTube videos, so if you are watching or listening to this on YouTube, this is his work. Thanks to him so much. You can follow him on Twitter at History Shift or find him on YouTube, History Shift. Also, Pod Doodles takes our podcasts and turn them, turns them into doodles. You can watch him draw while listening to the podcast. It's really cool. And, of course, Cosmographia, the podcast we do with Randall Carlson. Don't forget about that. And you can find it on Geocosmic Rex or the Cosmographia channel. Uh, and we want to say thanks to Where Did the Road Go, Uncharted X, Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape, The C Word Podcast, Grimerica, and Conspira Normal. Thanks all you guys so much. And thanks to all of you listeners. We really appreciate you being there. And we love being here once a week to talk with you guys. It's so great. Yep. Favorite yep. day of the week. That's right. We love you. Always have. Always will. <laughs> Good night, Adamo. Get back to work. 